Glass ceilings have two things going for them. They're see-through, and they were meant to be broken. Since the beginning of the U.S. Air Force's history, women have set their sights beyond barriers and shattered any that got in their way. In 1943, women were called to serve out of necessity. With men increasingly heading to combat during World War II, their stateside roles were left open. What started out as an experiment evolved into a path that would change history. Women were vital to the war effort. They served as radio operators, maintenance specialists, and test pilots. Some even flew overseas to evacuate wounded troops from the sands of North Africa and the beaches of Normandy. They proved they were capable of more than tradition assumed. Little did they know that their curiosity and courage to do something different would set the foundation for future generations of women to rise above barriers. The first woman to earn two stars was an airman. The first female fighter pilot was an airman. The first military women to walk among the stars and command space shuttles were airmen. And the first woman to serve as the senior enlisted leader for any military branch is an airman. But it's not just the number of women who serve. It's what each and every one brings to our force. Women's achievements in the Air Force and now the U.S. Space Force are endless. As both branches continue to evolve, what defines success has to. Reaching new heights is less about being the first and more about being empowered to be who you are and achieve what you want to achieve. Women have helped change and continue to advance standards from fighting for all dependents to receive equal benefits to earning the right to serve in combat and for some, making the ultimate sacrifice. Standard issue no longer fits what we're capable of. It never did. As we set our sights higher, new leaders can step forward. They already have and will continue to make room for more. It's fitting that the two most forward-thinking branches serve two domains that have represented hope and possibility for centuries, the sky and the stars. The Air Force and the Space Force were established by looking up and daring to see more. So where will you set your sights? You never know how far you will go and who you might inspire along the way. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the host of this year's Women's in Aerospace Power Symposium and the Commander of Space Operations Command, Lieutenant General David N. Miller, Jr. Morning. I thought, I, I can't believe that is the greeting I'm getting after that video. How about we try it again? Good morning. Good morning. There we go. So, you know, I, I had some comments here, and I'm going to do what my speechwriter loves, which is change them. Um, mostly because as I saw that video, I, I'm mindful of um, this year's theme, Stronger Together, Seamal Fortier. But as I saw that video, I just kept hearing in my head, that's what winning looks like. And I think... You know, I got to I got to do a booyah this morning because I'm just about to come out of my seat. And they told me I can't move from here because the lights won't move. So uh, I'm gonna need to animate through you. Is that okay? All right. So if you if you agree with me that um, for the over 400,000 women who are serving on active duty right now, and when you consider our civilian teammates, we're up over a half a million. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of them, but we are standing on the shoulders of giants. And when I see um, and am inspired by the women in our services, both Air Forces and Space Forces, uh, I just got to scream. So what I want you to do is get up. We're going to start this off right, and we're going to keep it going. If you agree with me 
that the women in the American military just kick ass in every way. I want you to give me a booyah, like you, like I want you to blow this woman so she can't even do the, the hand signals for people watching. Are you with me? Hold up, hold up. I didn't call you yet. I like the enthusiasm. On three. One, two, three. Booyah! All right. Here we go. Thank you. I don't even know how you booyah for sign language, but she got it. Have a seat. So we're here to celebrate the impact of women in our military service. Um, if you could go to the next chart. Um, you know, I, I'm just inspired by the team that I'm on, the team that I'm serving with, and the people who've gone before me. And what you see represented on this chart um, is women throughout the decades, but really is throughout the centuries. Because if you go back as, on the far left here is a representation of uh, Molly Pitcher, who in the founding battles of this republic at the Battle of Monmouth, when her husband was injured, picked up the cannon and started firing against the British forces. Up until, from then until today, the women in our, our military have not only performed every role that we've asked of them, as Molly Pitcher's done, they've done what's needed of them. And I think that that is the inspiration that I, I'd like you to take away from these next few days. I'm going to introduce the Undersecretary here in a little bit, but if you'll indulge me, um, I do have some things I want to say. Um, whether it was Molly Pitcher, whether it was Harriet Tubman, who was um, a nurse, but also people don't know often, and they are, they're mindful of the Underground Railroad. She was a spy, an intelligence, and a targeting officer for the Union Army. That's what she did. And she was a force multiplier like you'd never seen before. And this was a role and a function she was performing when she wasn't even recognized as a citizen of this nation. Um, so when I say to you that I'm inspired by the women who've come before us, it's because they've not just done what's asked of them, they've done what's needed. And I think that's a theme that I'd like you to take away from this week. And it carries on to the rest of the women who are on this chart. Um, you can go to Wilma Vaught, Comptroller, um, first woman to deploy with a B-52 wing, um, Anna Mae Hayes. Um, after 1948, the Women in Service Act steps up and serves in the Korean War. Our women air service pilots, which are represented in the video, all the way to the Gulf War, which I think you began to see as Martha McSally was a representative of the women who embraced combat roles and served in an A-10, providing close air support in support of our troops. Um, all the way to the post-9-11 era, and there was a picture of her on here, because some didn't just give time, they gave everything. And A1C Jacobson, who was deployed to Camp Bucca, Iraq in 2005, was defending joint and coalition forces at a time when this nation needed it, gave everything. The ultimate sacrifice, killed by an IED, first Special Forces Airman and first female service member to die in Operation Iraqi Freedom. Um, even to today, in my service, which we just celebrated four years, we've got women like Captain Tasha Reed, who's on the right, um, a couple of years ago when the Iranians launched missiles at al-Assad, she was the planner on duty, tasked the infrared surveillance and warning sensors, provided the warning network needed so that everybody could get cover, and as a result of that, there were no casual or no fatalities that day. Um, so whether it's the founding days of the Republic or to today, women have done exactly what this nation needed, not just what they asked for. So I'd ask you to think about that, and particularly I'm going to go through a few women as I introduce the Undersecretary, who to me represent the inspiration that we're talking about. Um, if you could go to the next chart. This is, uh, anybody know who this is? Because I just cheated and gave you the name on the slide. Um, <laughs> Dr. Gladys West. Um, if you used, well, I guess if some of you, who flew here today? Anybody? Okay. So I, I can't see much here, to be honest with you, but I'm assuming there's some hands up. Um, you drove here today, some of you probably flew in, um, and used the blue dot on your phone. Um, satellite geodesy wasn't even a thing when Gladys West graduated from Virginia State University as a mathematician, got her master's degree, went to work for what is now the Naval Surface Warfare Center in Dahlgren, and built the math behind the algorithms that are fundamental to the position, navigation, and timing signal that really underscores almost everything we do 
as a United States military. It doesn't just get civilians to work. You get your clocks going every day. If there's civilian applications are through the roof, whether it's secure banking or timing. But really, it powers the projection of the United States military. And it's because this woman, who at that time would be challenged to vote or do much else, said, I got to get this right. Um, it is women like Dr. Gladys West, who we couldn't get to be here today. Um, I think she's, she's 93 and she's still kicking. You know, she got a PhD in 2000. Um, I got trouble reading the assignments they give me every day, and she's getting PhDs. Um, I can't tell you how proud I am to serve with civilians like this. Um, it's not just the people in uniform, as I mentioned to you earlier. Go to the next chart, please. Um, I think Colonel Black is on our way in from what I gather is the weather, you know, it's still winter in some places, and as you saw last week in Colorado, it still snows. Um, but Colonel Allison Black um, will be here as a panelist, and she's actually coming to my house for dinner tonight. Um, many of you know her by her nom de guerre, the angel of death. Um, she's retiring after 32 years of service, prior enlisted officer retiring as a commander of the 1st Special Operations Wing um, as First Lieutenant Black on an AC-130 gunship over Kunduz in Afghanistan. And this is like November of 2001 with the horse soldiers. This isn't after a bunch of forces are in place to provide the level of support that you were used to when you deployed later and follow on echelons. Um, she's reigning hate and discontent on the Taliban to the extent where General Dostum keys the mic. He's, uh, he didn't really understand secure communications like we were not supposed to be keying the mic while she was talking. Um, but keys the mic and says, the Americans are so committed, they've sent their women to kill you. Surrender. Booyah. Exactly. <laughs> I think that deserves another booyah. Who's with it? On three. One, two, three. Booyah. That's what I'm talking about, man. Um, these are women inspire you. It's, it's a level of character. There's a competence in them. There's a level of perseverance that won't say no. And I think there's a level of commitment that, as I said, they never do just what is asked. They do what is needed. And I think that's a distinction that people often underestimate from our military service. It's why they do, the women in our military do so well for us. Um, it's why, when you hear from the undersecretary in the moment, um, so many of them are filled with such great responsibility. It's because we recognize and tap into this in a way that, frankly, no other military service has. So. I'm very proud to call these women teammates and on my team. You're going to get a chance to hear from Colonel Black here over the next couple of days, and I think you're going to, I mean, you should get her autograph or something, but um, she's impressive. And my last chart I'm going to use to introduce the uh, undersecretary. Could you go to the next chart, please? Um, by the way, Colonel Black is from New York, so I just want to point that out for the rest of you. Um, we, don't need, we don't have enough New Yorkers in the military, for the record. I know this is being recorded. We need more New Yorkers. <laughs> More Yankee fans. Um, you know, under, the Undersecretary is, uh, began her career as a military intelligence officer, graduating from West Point. I think she was from California, but she knew that she needed to go to a good school, so she came to New York. Um, and she's risen to be, obviously, the second highest ranking civilian in the Department of the Air Force. Um, she had a successful civilian and military career. She's responsible for organizing, training, and equipping more than 700,000 active duty guard and reserve teammates. And she's really led um, in our focus on great power competition over the last few months, um, this need to revitalize where we stand vis-a-vis -vis our, our role in the world. Um, this world is becoming increasingly uncertain in many respects. The um, aggression you've seen. I mean, I, I've made the comment before that I have rarely seen the United States military as globally engaged as we are today in so many places with so many forces forward um, and operating at risk. And if you're not sure about it, just check the news every day about what our maritime forces are doing in the Red Sea um, or our air forces are doing um, to disrupt um, gathering threats from whether it's Iran or the Houthis um, in the Gulf. Um, that's a team sport, 
And when you have leaders like Kristen Jones who recognize that um, it's not just where we've been that's going to power us moving forward, it's setting conditions for the future. That's what great power competition is all about and reoptimizing our service. It's about readiness for the diverse range of threats. And for many of you, I don't remind you of the oath that we've taken, but it is not to a person. It is to a document and the principles of the Republic. And what I believe, as I've listened, learned over the past few weeks, and as I will do over the next couple of days, um, that the women in our military service represent the best principles of that document. It's called the Constitution of the United States of America. And I think there's no finer symbol of that um, than people like Colonel Allison Black, who we just talked about in a moment, but also people like our Undersecretary, Kristen Jones. So if you'll do me a favor, let's welcome the Honorable Kristen Jones to be here and represent and speak to us as a part of a panel uh, on where we're headed and also the roles and the importance of our teammates in this military service called the American men, women who are the best that America has to offer. Thank you. That was kind of awkward with like an applause for welcome and thank you. All right. The door is not opening. I guess she's coming. So I could tell some jokes. I don't have many jokes. My son gave me one this weekend, but there's some profanity in it, so I won't use that one. Oh, okay. Are we ready, guys? I can't see anything, so if you're signaling me or telling me something, I'm supposed to do it. So have a seat. Okay, I was told she'd be here at 8.05. All right, so um, let's talk more about great power competition. <laughs> um, this is good. I love it when a plan comes together. Booyah. How about readiness, huh? Um, okay, let's, let's spitball here. So you guys have seen the um, program, yes? As I was looking at the program, there were a few key panels that I think are going to be great, in addition to the panel that's upcoming and apparently cannot stop, start before 0830. Um, what do you guys think is the most exciting one that we should rework our schedules to attend? Somebody stand up, help me out. Anyone? Bueller? You guys remember that? Does anybody else watch movies like I do? Okay. Um, so there's a panel tomorrow. Keynote speaking by General Burt. Colonel Black will be on a panel. I think it's the one on navigating obstacles to readiness. Um, there's a panel on Thursday. Um, that's called Unleashing Your Superpowers. Um, those are the ones that I think are exciting. I don't know about you guys. Any feedback, questions? Man, you can tell I'm filling time, and I'm not doing it great. Um, okay. So, we're reintroducing. If you're waving at me, I can't see it. Oh, yes. Hello. I'll just count, sir. Oh, that's that's doing what's needed, not what's asked. Very yes, nice. Sir. All right, sir. What's up, Major Aaron Leon, uh, U.S. Space Forces Space Public Affairs? I love it. I was wondering if you'd be willing to answer a few questions. I One know. from me, maybe some from others. Sure. Great, sir. So I think that there's a lot of Air Force people here that maybe um, haven't heard some of the changes that are happening in regards to great power competition in the Space Force. Mm -hmm. One in particular is the combat squadrons, combat readiness squadrons. Yeah. I'm not sure how we're referring to them exactly, but could you explain a little bit more about that construct and how the Space Force is doing and employed in place? Sure. That's great. Good question. Thank you. Thank you for that. Look at PA coming to the rescue. How about it? Give her a round of applause. 
Um, no, that's good. Um, so as many of you know, the service is uh, in its fourth year. We've gone from establishment to implementation. And one of the things that we realized we needed to formulate was how we would present our, what we call our unit of action. Um, in the past, if you looked at our forces presentation model, we give the entire squadron, the secretary, the force modernization team, the maintenance element that did longer term maintenance and left almost nothing back in the service to generate, train, and prepare the next echelon so that we constantly be providing a level of readiness and a focus on the threats, but also the requirements of the combatant commanders. So what we've done in our force generation model is identify that unit of action called the combat squadron that will have a composition in the three pieces, uh, most notably. The first is the combat crew, which will have space, cyber, and ISR professionals integrated into each formation. So every shift, every 24-7 that are standing watch, whether they're doing PNT and nav war or doing electromagnetic warfare, They'll have a composition team that allows them to have the intel targeting and cyber defense, as well as the space operations to people, uh, guardians that you're used to. We'll also have a mission planning element as the second component of that combat squadron. That mission planning cell will focus on the intel that we see coming forward over the next couple of days, and also the integration across units, because the force structure that we've had was never designed to operate by itself. It was always designed to be a warfighting team. Um, we just hadn't implemented that as a service yet and had mostly focused on providing the services or space-enabled capabilities in the past. And then the last piece will be our mission support element. And this is where our engineers, our security forces representation, our maintenance personnel who are providing and maintaining the infrastructure. And for me, infrastructure on the base is part of my weapon system. Um, so whether that's my CE personnel or whatever, they're part of that mission support element. That will constitute a wholly presented unit that will go to the combatant commanders. And I think we are on the cusp of getting to a level of readiness because we have identified every one of those force elements in a way that we've never done before. They're actually going through right now training together to face the range of threats that are spelled out in the national defense strategy. And they'll be presented as one combat team across all of our force in your evolution is starting over here in the summer. So I'm excited about this opportunity. It normalizes how the Space Force presents combat power, similar to the other services. But where we've done before is identify, um, source, and train those tailored units of action in a way that we've not done before. So I think it's goodness, uh, for sure. And as the lead for force generation for the service, uh, I'm really excited about it. So thank you for that. And as I pivot back to the chart, um, as I said previously, um, the Undersecretary is our second um, in charge of the service in terms of our civilian leadership. She has a history of military service as an intelligence officer, has a successful career in the civilian world and come back both from financial management and comptroller, um, previously in another service, but also here now in our service. And she is going to continue to do a great job for us, I'm sure. But um, in the near term, she's going to represent on a panel here and moderated by Colonel Jackson, and I think will be an outstanding panel for you. So if you'll do me a favor and let's give the Undersecretary of the Air Force a big booyah and welcome as you stand up. And on three, we're going to say welcome to the Undersecretary of the Air Force with a big booyah. One, two, three. Booyah! All right. Madam Undersecretary, you guys can clap. Good morning, Marcus. All right, have a seat. I'm going to turn this off so I'm not interrupting. I'm Colonel Marcus Jackson, uh, Command, uh, Chief of Staff of Space Operations Command. I'll be moderating today's uh, question and answer uh, period.
but definitely this is an opportunity for all of us to get uh, some great insight from you. So we've got a series of questions. Hopefully uh, there are things that uh, uh, you have great insight in, but more importantly, it's an opportunity for teammates to kind of get that kind of strategic perspective from a, a fantastic leader. So with that, we'll just go ahead and kick off a series of questions. Okay. Okay, how about that? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Our first question for today is uh, the Department of the Air Force recently rolled out a, out a host of changes in order to re-optimize for great power competition. Can you talk about where we are in that process and a, a little bit about your role? Sure, happy to. And thanks to all of you for being here, including those online and for the team that put this together. Um, one of my first activities as the acting undersecretary last year was this same event, doing it from the Pentagon. So thrilled to be back here again to talk with all of you. So as far as uh, our efforts on great power competition, this has been in the works for a little while. Uh, the secretary and the chiefs and I meet every morning at 7.30 to talk about what's going on in the world, uh, what's coming up in our day, congressional engagements from the day before, things like that. Um, and a lot of the time we were talking about our experiences going out to visit with all of you at our bases around the world. And we said, everybody is doing a fantastic job, but we're not really on a war footing. And what I mean by that is that we'd spent the last 30 years focused on very small deployments, primarily in the Middle East, violent extremist organizations, and now we have a very different threat. Our pacing challenge is China, and we need to be prepared for what we're calling great power competition. And our goal is to deter conflict, but if it comes, to be prepared to fight and win. And we just didn't feel like collectively we were postured to do that. So we looked at what were the things that we thought needed to be done, but wanted to get a much broader perspective from our force. And so we had about a five-month sprint across a number of different lines of effort to figure out what are the things that we really need to do. We did tabletop exercises, we did MAGCOM uh, engagements. So a lot of people, about 1,500 people, were involved in coming up with what was 24 initiatives that we rolled out at AFA. And they were in a number of different areas related to our people, our readiness, our power projection, and our capability development. And the goal is not to be ready to fight on any given day. 2027 is a day that often is in the media. But it's to be ready to fight and win at any time and to continue to have the capabilities that we need for the future, to win the competition and hopefully never into that pure conflict phase. So what's my role? Uh, the first is that as part of the top four leadership team with the secretary and the two service chiefs is to make sure that we have alignment across the Air Force and Space Force on all of these various initiatives, that they're integrated, that they're moving forward, that we have actionable POAMs, in particular making sure that as we identify resource requirements that we're looking for how we would execute on those kinds of things. And then in particular for my role uh, as the undersecretary, I'm leading the efforts in the secretariat. Now probably a lot of you don't really know what the secretariat does. I certainly didn't when I was you know, a second lieutenant in uniform out in Germany. I didn't know what those folks in the Pentagon did. But um, the Secretariat is responsible for organizing, training, and equipping the department, so both air and space. And there's a couple of things that we're doing specific to the Secretariat that we think are going to help us to be more integrated and more ready. So the three that we announced at AFA, one is a new office that's basically institutionalizing the work we've done for the last couple of years on the operational imperatives. So those of you who heard me talk about that uh, at AFA, we basically, in order to meet the secretary's intent on the operational imperatives, had to create a, a pickup team. We grabbed a bunch of people from a number of different places. Tim Grayson uh, was the leader of that team. And we worked to identify what are the things that we really need to do to close our operational gaps to be prepared for great power competition. And that 
set us on a path for a number of modernization efforts. But we wanted to make sure that we had a way to continue that effort and to look for what were going to be the capabilities that we needed for the future. So that new office is one of the things that we're doing. Uh, we also have a, a competitive activities office that we're standing up. I can't say too much about that in an unclass environment, but we're basically harnessing the capabilities of a number of different organizations for greater effects. And then the last major organizational change is with our creation of a PA&E, Program Analysis and Evaluation. And some of the other services have this type of capability. For us, it's particularly important as we look at air and space capabilities. And in some cases, we're changing from air-based platforms to space-based platforms. And how do we make sure that we're doing that in a logical way, that we have the right transition plans, uh, the right funding allocated, and things like that. So those are the three big offices that we talked about at AFA. There are a number of other initiatives that we're doing, uh, including bringing our diversity and inclusion initiatives into MR so that they're impacting all of our people programs, which I think is going to be really important. Um, we're also changing some of the roles for our CIO and how that cascades into the force. So there's a couple of other things that we're doing in the Secretariat, and that's the part of the Great Power Competition uh, initiative that I'm responsible for. Thank you. So the next question. Excuse my command. By micro perspective. How do you uh, see the role of airmen and guardians changing as we shift focus from uh, two great power competitions and also as we have uh, significant changes in technology uh, specifically? Yes, yeah, so, uh, hello. Uh, so I appreciate General Miller's comment earlier related to the Space Force. Uh, both services are really looking at this unit of action and how we deploy as units, again, not this pickup game type concept, but really units that are ready to fight um, using the Afrogen and Space 4 Gen concepts to go through that process of generating readiness. Uh, so that's going to be a big deal. We're also looking at a new concept for our base wings that some of you may have seen that in the past, but, but really making sure that with the nature of conflict today, that we have someone who is dedicated to fighting the base, making sure that we've got the power, that we're looking at cyber, all of the other things associated with the base, while the other units at that location are preparing to deploy or to fight employed in place. So those are a couple of things that are going to change the way we train, the way we choose commanders. Uh, we're going to have a, a new level of commander that we're uh, focusing on and less at the ops and the group level. So you'll see changes about that rolling out in the future. Uh, we're having warrant officers come in for cyber and IT. So I think that's a pretty big deal. That's moving fast. We're expecting our first warrant officers later this year. Um, and then you mentioned specifically AI. And that's important in a number of different areas, whether it's um, in the business systems and using robotic process automation or other analytical tools for intelligence and battle management at the speed and scale that we're going to need to. And then for human machine teaming and things like our collaborative combat aircraft, because we need to be able to have more affordable mass and we're going to be using AI for some of those concepts. So I think it's a really exciting time and definitely our focus on the STEM skills, um, cyber, IT and others are really important for the future fight. How has the Department of the Air Force leadership? Appreciate. How has the uh, Department of the Air Force uh, leadership tried to manage those restraints and challenges? Yeah, and there's a lot there. So uh, I'm performing two roles: uh, the basically acting undersecretary, and then still um, officially my role as the FM for the department. So I get involved in those issues quite a lot. Thankfully, we just got our bill for 24, almost halfway through the year, and that was causing a lot of concerns when we were looking, you know, here we are uh, with a lot of uh, guardians. We were looking at canceling seven of our national security space launches. Um, for both services, 
uh, we've had the operational imperatives and what we've wanted to do from a modernization standpoint. And we haven't been able to get those dollars for all of the new starts, 89 new starts that we had planned for 24. So thankfully, we're through that process, but unfortunately, I don't see that being the end of CRs. They've, they've become more normal uh, than they should be. And, and so that's something that we continue to ask our elected leaders to help us out with. That's the best way that they can support all of us and our families. Uh, moving on to 25. So um, we just rolled out our budget. That's one of the other things that I get to do is roll out the department's budget and um, speak with the media, congressional engagements, OMB, et cetera. Um, our focus this year because of the Fiscal Responsibility Act was to make sure that we maintain at least the minimum level of readiness for our force. We also gave everyone a pretty significant pay raise, more on the military side than on civilians, for base pay, housing, et cetera. Um, so we needed to cover that. So that meant there was a little less money than we wanted to have for our modernization programs. So um, for the Space Force, there was still a pretty significant increase over the last several years in the budget. Unfortunately, that doesn't continue as we move uh, into 25. Um, the Air Force, uh, just a slight increase. So that, that made us take some really tough choices uh, in order to preserve our readiness and deal with the fact that inflation was higher than the growth in our top line. We had to minimize some of our programs, both in R&D and procurement. Um, in some cases, those were fact of life changes just because of the execution of the programs. But in other areas, it was, it was pretty difficult. Um, but in general, what we're trying to do with our resources is to balance readiness and modernization, take care of people, make sure that we have the force that we need today, while also building for the capabilities in the future. Yes, ma'am. We're grateful to have uh, this symposium hosted by Space Operations Command. It's now been four years since the establishment of the Space Force. Can you tell us where you think standing up the new service has gone well? Where are you seeing uh, challenges? And what you see for the uh, future trajectory of the service? Absolutely. Um, you know, before coming into my FM role, I didn't know nearly as much about space as I do now. Um, so much of it is classified and sapped that it's hard to really understand everything that we're doing. But I am so impressed by what the Space Force has been able to accomplish in the last four years. Um, one of my responsibilities in this role is I, I sit on basically our board of directors for DOD with the deputy secretary, the OSD leadership, the combatant commands. And it is clear across the department how much space power is valued. The fact that space has become a warfighting domain is very much recognized. And what the secretary and General Saltzman talk about is the need to move from a merchant marine where you have basically an uncontested environment, you're providing services that are needed, to now needing a Navy where you're not in an uncontested environment. You're in a war fighting domain and you have to have the capabilities to do that. So what I've seen over the last four years is that the Space Force has built a lot of foundational capability. Um, we're now getting out into all the combatant commands. Um, we have some joint positions, not what we need. Um, but there's this innovative spirit that I think is really awesome. Um, and it's allowing the Space Force to pilot new things like the Personnel Management Act that's going to allow for that flexibility between full-time and part-time. There's the, the PT standards where you know, we're looking at new ways of, of measuring our fitness. So there's so many great things that the Space Force is doing, but we need to move to that next level to have the capabilities as a warfighting domain where we have more joint positions, we have a better trajectory to the right number of general officers that we need to lead the service and to operate with our joint partners. Um, we need to continue to build out the proliferated architectures that are so critical for the future. And then um, also the space control capabilities, recognizing that we are dealing with a contested domain. Our next question is more of a macro question. Um, the evolution of gender roles across the Department of Defense and beyond is clear as we see developments in policies and progressive changes to seemingly traditional roles. How, uh, how have you witnessed changes in your responsibilities in the DOD or society? Yeah, that's a really important question. And 
I had the privilege of being on a panel at National Defense University just last week with the first female member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Franchetti, who's the CNO, and with uh, Secretary Warmoth, who's the Secretary of the Army, both firsts in their roles. Um, so that was an honor for me to be part of that. And one of the things that I think about is over the last couple of decades, we've been measuring the firsts, the first generals, the first fighter pilots, the first army rangers, the first combatant commanders. And, and I think we'll really have succeeded when we no longer have to count the firsts, when it just becomes normal that you see women represented at the levels that they are first for general officers at the level that we have female officers. And then eventually that we're more representative of our society as a whole. So we have a little bit of a ways to go, but still the idea that women can serve in any position at, at all levels uh, shows so far that we've come. Uh, so I mentioned I was an Army second lieutenant in Intel. And at the time that I was serving, I didn't see any role models that had what I aspired to from a family perspective, that I would be married and have kids and, and could look to them as people who had done that. I just didn't see it when I was young. Um, and yet, a, a couple of months ago, I had the opportunity, I brought in all of the three-star women who worked in the Pentagon for the Air Force and Space Force. Some of them are, are folks that you know well. Um, Nina Armagno, Mary O'Brien, Donna Shipton, uh, Leah Lauterbach, and, and quite a few more. And it was a great opportunity for me to hear their stories and how they went from the young second lieutenants that they once were to now at the three-star level and some of the sacrifices that they had had to make. But still, those are now role models for everybody else to say, I can do that. It might be hard. I'm not saying it's not going to be hard. But, but there are people who have navigated that. There are people who are at senior levels who understand the policy implications that we have and want to change that so that we can keep women in our force. Some of the things like not making pregnancy such a barrier for PME, for OTS, even for flying, that we need to make sure that we continue to use uh, and to hear the voices from the WIT and others so that we look at those things that would be barriers that impact women's ability to continue to serve and we're dealing with that. And I think that's going to help significantly from a retention standpoint, but also all of you are our best recruiters. And as you share your stories, uh, you know, you're great ambassadors for that next generation to say, I did this. I can have a successful career. I can have the family situation that I want. And the Air Force and Space Force are allowing me to do that to the best of my abilities. Roger that. Along those same lines, uh, what would you consider be, would be the uh, most significant barrier that women in leadership face and how can that be addressed? So I had the opportunity to listen to CQ Brown at Chief Bass's retirement. I don't know, did, did any of you have the opportunity to watch the live stream of that? Hopefully somebody uh, in the audience did. I thought one of the, the greatest things that he said is when opportunity knocks, make sure you're dressed. Yeah. Okay, so, so what does that mean? I think when women are given the opportunity to serve in senior roles, we're doing a fabulous job. The question is, will you ever be teed up for that role in the first place? So that's way left of the decision for a promotion board or a particular selection for a job. It's doing all the things from the beginning that get you competitive so that when opportunity knocks, you're dressed. So that's being ready for the right command jobs. It's having sponsorships that when you're not in the room, somebody is saying, I know the perfect person for that job and I want to give her that opportunity. Um, one example that, that I think about with that, um, so I work in the area of the Pentagon that's often referred to as the glass doors. And the number of women aides and senior military assistants has dramatically increased over the last couple of years. And you might say, well, why is that important? Well, if you ask almost every one of our three stars or four stars, they had those jobs. It gave them that enterprise perspective when they were majors or lieutenant colonels that they're, they're now building on as three stars and four stars. So I think it's, it's making sure that we are um, putting ourselves out there for those kinds of jobs, 
that we are building mentorships, not just with people that look exactly like us, but with other people. Um, we're doing the schools that we need to do. All of those things to be prepared for those opportunities when they come calling. The second thing that I would say about that is we still have challenges related to children. I mentioned some of the progress that we've made with pregnancy and, and there's so many other things and I know that you'll be talking about that more during the session about what we've changed to be more um, friendly for women who want to uh, have careers and also have families. But there's more to do. I, I still see sometimes people refer to childcare as a woman's issue. No, it's a readiness issue. We need to make sure that we are taking care of our families and that allows for our service members, both men and women, to be able to do their jobs. So I think there's still some cultural things where, you know, if a child gets sick, it's often mom that's the first one to be called or, or things like that. And I think we're making a ton of progress in that regard as a society and within the military, uh, but there's more to do. And I know that all of you have ideas for that. And so we want to hear those ideas. We want you to think about what are the things that allow you to serve to the best of your capabilities and how do we continue to remove some of those barriers? Now we have a few more personal questions for you. The symposium has an overwhelming total force representation, air and space force military and civilians, officers and enlisted, Air National Guard and Air Reserve. Considering the number of changes in recent years and new leaders emerging at all levels, what is one piece of advice you would give to our newest leaders who are simply trying to find their way? Yeah, that's a good question um, because what got you here won't necessarily get you there. And when you find yourself in a, a leadership role, what do you focus on? Um, so advice I heard many, many years ago, I don't even remember who was the first one to, to tell me this, but a phrase that I've remembered and, and I like to share with others is that leadership is a verb. And what do I mean by that? It, it can be um, you know, prideful to say, I made this rank, whether that's going from a fourth degree to now I'm an upperclassman at the Air Force Academy to I just pinned on a star on my uniform or whatever it might be. And to be focused on the fact that I achieved this lofty position, I have power. Um, and what I want to focus on instead, and I hope that you all do, is that those give you opportunities for responsibility. That you are now responsible for a person, a team, a project, a mission, an organization. Even if you're not in a, a position of formal power, when you have the opportunity to lead a project, you still have that responsibility. So, you know, as an example, sometimes when I'm introduced, there's this discussion about 700,000 total force airmen, guardians, civilians. And so what I think about is that I have a responsibility for helping to take care of you, for getting the resources that you need, for making sure that the policies that we have in place are what you need to be. So, you know, leadership as a verb means building relationships with your team, it's building trust, it's leading with empathy, it's holding people accountable. It's not about you know, what rank you're wearing on your shoulders or your chest, but it's having that uh, responsibility for building the team, whether that's the folks who are here with you now and making sure that, that you're accomplishing the mission together and you're getting the most out of the capabilities of all those folks, but also building the next generation. Uh, so that's one of the things that, that I always like to share. Another one, and this gets back to what I was talking about with barriers, is, is not waiting your turn. And what I mean by that is, um, especially as women, we sometimes wait until we feel like we're 100% prepared before we act. Whether that's saying, I'm ready for that command position, I'm ready for that next job, or even speaking up in a room. Oh, I don't know that what I'm gonna say is all that important. And so what I would say to you is don't be afraid to move out. We need you to move out. Um, I, I had a situation not too long ago where I was waiting to be called on in a room. I was the only woman in the, well, no, I wasn't the only woman in the room. I was the only government woman in the room. There were some industry folks there and kind of waiting to be called on. And I didn't say anything. And I noticed nobody else, none of the other women in the room said anything either. I think they were maybe waiting for me. Um, so later in that same conference, this was a, a previous AFA, 
I was much more intentional about, I'm gonna say something. I have a voice. What I have to say is important. I'm gonna say something. And I noticed that that opened the room up to several of the other women speaking. So, you know, we are role models. If you're a second lieutenant, there are the folks that you are leading that are looking up to you. If you are a four-star general, same thing, and everyone in between. So people are watching to see, can I have the freedom to lead? And so I would say, go for it. You know, take those steps, even when you feel like I'm not 100% prepared. Just do it. Um, and then the, the last thing that I would say on the, the leadership standpoint, um, the, the secretary said numerous times at AFA, we are out of time. And so with that in mind, one of the things that leaders need to be prepared to do is to underwrite the mistakes of their subordinates that are in the pursuit of excellence. And what do I mean by that? I mean, if you have done everything that you could to prepare, you've done all of the right planning, you will still sometimes make mistakes. And we need our leaders to support folks in innovating and failing fast and learning and continuing to push us forward. The out of time means we don't have the time to sit around and, and live in fear, live in this world that, oh my gosh, if I take a step, then I'm going to get in trouble, so I just won't do it. We need people moving in the right direction. And, and that's going to mean that sometimes we make mistakes. And we need you as leaders to help make sure that your folks feel that, that you are supporting them through that, you're helping them learn. Not everything's going to go 100% right all of the time, but we'll move faster together if we take the fear out of it and allow people to innovate and learn and sometimes make mistakes. So we're going to pivot to a question that's a whole person concept. So during the symposium, we plan to discuss the importance of a healthy work and home life balance and harness the techniques to make ourselves more resilient. How have you succeeded with balancing your professional and home responsibilities? What advice could you give to uh, some of our members who may not have found that balance yet? Yeah, that's a hard one. Um, and, and I would say the only way that I have even been able to find some balance is because I have an amazing spouse. Um, we don't have uh, you know, a support system. None of our family lives nearby or anything like that. And so he has been amazing throughout my career. And, and even when it looked like I was likely to become an SES, he declined command when he was a lieutenant colonel so that my career could continue to move on and thrive. So I am greatly appreciative of my husband. Um, but not everybody has that situation. And so what does work-life balance mean? Um, this is another one I heard some advice a long time ago that I wanted to share. I think if you look at work-life balance on an individual day, day by day, you're likely to be disappointed because many of us have days that are just overwhelming. But if you look at it not by day or by week, but across seasons, across years, did you have balance in your life? Did you have a sense of harmony? And what I mean by that, sometimes work is going to be 100% what you need to focus on. You know, you're deploying or you are deployed. Um, you're in the thick of things and that has to be what you're focused on. And then other times you have that sick kid. You heard that your elderly parent is in the hospital and, and that's where your focus needs to be. And so it's going to ebb and flow. But to me, successful work-life balance is over time. Did I get it about right? And if I'm not, then what are the things that I can do to change that? How do I really take leave when it's time for me to take leave? How do I outsource things that other people can do on my behalf? You know, whether that's uh, having groceries delivered or getting the house clean or whatever it might be for you that allows you to take things off of your plate so that you can have that work-life balance. So that would be my advice is to get a good support system around, whether it's your spouse or others that love you and, and care for you so that you have somebody to rely on uh, when times get tough and outsource what you need and think about it not day by day, but at a longer time horizon. And, and I think you'll find that you can have much more harmony and work-life balance in that regard. Amen. So at this time, we're going to pivot uh, to opening the questions to the audience and on to the online uh, teammates. So at this time, uh, if there, you have any questions, there's two uh, microphones set up, and we'll just go one by one.
Testing. Okay. okay. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, <laughs> Michelle Goudreau, Chief Scientist of Space Operations Command. I was recently, I liked your thing about, you know, talk out, speak up when you have something to say, if you have something important. I was recently in a small group discussion with three peers of about all male, and there was one female support contractor. It's a very small meeting. I tried to get them to listen to me. I even raised my hand at one point, and there was almost nothing I could do to get them to listen to me. Is there, I'm just wondering if you've ever been in that kind of situation? I felt like the one to get rid of the guys and just let the contract support me figure out the problem and get it solved. But I'm um, just wondering if, if you have any thoughts on how to deal with not being able to get your word in. <laughs> Yeah, I, I have been in situations like that, and, and they are frustrating. Or when you finally get the chance to say something, people don't listen, and then somebody else is uh, basically saying exactly what you said, and then they get the credit. Yeah, been there. Uh, <laughs> so the, the best thing that I could say is it's helpful to be prepared for what you're going to say, to have done the homework that you need before going in the room, to make your remarks as concise as possible so that you get the message out. Um, where somebody starts to kind of steal your thunder, you know, it can sometimes be helpful to say, picking up on what he said, blah, 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 and then you keep going. And then if there are, are people who are just continuously not allowing you to talk, that'd probably be one that I would take offline and just have a, a conversation about, you know, what your thoughts were and, and you'll likely find that the person is receptive to those thoughts and then when you say, it was very difficult for me to get anything out during that meeting. Can you help me? And, and maybe help to bring on allies so that other people recognize that you have something to say that they're going to contribute to you. Maybe they even throw a question to you in, in the future. Um, but I, I think making sure that you've got the right message um, and that you can get your words out quickly can sometimes be helpful because those situations are you know, uncomfortable and, and frustrating. So I feel your pain. Next question. Good morning, ma'am. My name is Ashton McLaughlin. I am with AFM IMSC Detachment 10. My question is a little loaded, but I am going to go for it. <laughs> um, can you speak to the realistic, like actual realistic rising Milcon costs and the layers of leadership between my level as a GS-13 and your level. Um, so those layers of leadership who don't want to present these costs to your level only for bids to come in much higher than budgeted and it kind of bites us in the behind, so to speak. Uh, let me clarify something. Who is preventing those um, the cost from being elevated, is it on the government side or the contractor side? Because that'll change my answer. Government side. And this is specifically in relation to new bed downs, not basic milk on costs. So we're talking okay. new bed downs where the costs could be in the hundreds of millions and billions. Okay. And the costs are very realistic and we're not just making them up. Okay. Yeah, I, I'll take that. I'll also try to apply it on the, the contractor side as well. Um, yeah, bad news doesn't get better with age. I don't know how many reprogramming actions I've had to sign because our initial estimates were just a fraction of what we actually needed. Uh, it's true on Milcon, it's true on our acquisition programs. Um, so one, we need to have a culture of transparency that we're actually gonna say what it takes to accomplish our missions and then figure out if we don't have all those resources, what we're gonna do about it. Are we able to do kind of a, a min viable product instead of what we'd really planned? Are we going to have to delay it? Are, are we going to cancel something else in order to accomplish that? But we need to have the data in order to have those productive discussions. Um, one of the things that I'm hoping that this PA&E organization is going to do is to help us see ourselves better. Um, because one of the examples that I would see over and over and over is related to bed down costs and things like that, where we brought our planes to location X, but we didn't bring the people, the, the maintainers, or we didn't bring the dorms or the hangars or the other uh, equipment that we needed. And so sometimes 
those were conscious decisions way below my level might be the type of thing that you're talking about. But we need to be able to see those and, and make more risk-informed choices. And so I'm hoping that by continuing to ask for the data, to ask for the analysis, that we will make better choices when we see ourselves. And we're not going to be able to afford everything. So we need to be smarter about what things we're going to do and not do. Um, and then on the flip side for industry, what we sometimes see is in order to win a bid, people will put in incredibly low um, costs in their proposals. And then that causes the same types of issues where a year or two into the project, we no longer have enough money to continue that project the way we planned because we didn't budget for it. So just in general across the board, we need to make sure that that we're data informed, that we have the transparency, that we have risk-based discussions so that we can buy what we need to do and not kid ourselves and then find out later that we're not able to accomplish the mission because we didn't plan for it effectively. But thank you for the question. Hello, ma'am. My name is Colonel Jason Kulcher. I'm currently the commander of the 17th Training Group at Goodfellow. You talked about the power in firsts, the power of um, being able to look up and see and believe. And um, can you talk about maybe the conversations that are happening within the Department of the Air Force? Because unfortunately, if you look at the Space Force leadership, if you look at the Air Force leadership, currently it's not very representative of our entire force. And so can you talk about maybe how we get there in the future? Yeah, that is a concern. That's actually what prompted this meeting that I mentioned earlier with all the three stars to say, well, what, what else can we do? Because it's, it's not that we're making decisions about the female three stars and not giving them four star opportunities. It was way back years ago, not having the pipeline behind them. So to, to get to your point, um, it is something that's being looked at, not just within the Department of the Air Force, but across the whole Department of Defense. Um, I am our representative to um, the Defense Workforce Council that the Deputy Secretary chairs. And these are the types of things that we talk about there. What can we do much earlier in the careers of our airmen and guardians and, and soldiers, sailors, et cetera, to make sure that we do have that pipeline, that we give people those opportunities. So it is very much a, a forefront of our thinking. Um, as we're making command decisions, that's also something that we're looking at. Um, what I would say for those of you who sit on the developmental teams and you have the ability to influence people's careers is get to know the entire team, everybody that you're representing, not just those who look like you, went to your same school that you, know, you want to go golfing with or whatever it might be, but really be able to represent the entire team because it's in those kinds of decisions where we're teeing up the command opportunities, where we're teeing up the school opportunities that are going to help us to build that pipeline. So we need leaders, particularly I would say at that field grade level who are representing the team below them, that we need you to, to be very intentional about making sure that you're evenly representing the entire team that you've got to bring into those sessions and not just the ones that you feel are closest to you or look like you. Ma'am, Major Sharon Arana. I am on ACC staff. I'm also a member of the WIT and um, Sword Athena core team. So my question for you is the Defense Advisory Committee on Women in the Services, the DACOWITS 2023 report was just released, and there are several recurring themes specifically related to barriers to readiness and recruitment and retention of women specifically. So my question to you is, or, or my ask is, can you speak to us about how your team is working to attack these barriers, specifically when we talk about access to health care and female fitment? Thank you. I'm sorry, what did you say after access to health care? Female fitment. So access to equipment specifically geared towards women. Huh. Yeah, that's an interesting one. I, I am thankful that I don't have to do that new Army PT test that uh, they were rolling out. That looked pretty horrendous. So. Um, no, I, I think healthcare is a big concern, and it is something that we're continuing to look at to make sure that we have policies in place, that we have funding in place for all of our force, because healthcare is tied to readiness. Um, I haven't read the particular Dockowitz report that you mentioned. Uh, it sounds like something that I should look at, but the the types of issues that we're seeing, they relate to our women in uniform. They also relate to the spouses and, and our dependents as well. 
Um, so we need to make sure that we are providing health care opportunities for all of us because, you know, in the, the same way that if we don't have the right health care for our women in uniform, if we don't have the right health care for our dependents, that could also make people leave and say, I'm not going to put up with this anymore. I, I'm not getting what I need to take care of my family. So health care, child care, all those things are, are very important. I think uh, new ways of looking at what does fitness really mean, and, and I really applaud what the Space Force is doing in that regard. Um, you know, not everybody is a great one and a half or two mile runner, depending on your particular service. Um, but you can be fit in many other ways. Um, our body fat standards, I think, don't necessarily reflect the types of bodies that we have in our force or, or in society these days. I think in general, you know, women have a, a lot more muscle mass and, and maybe are stronger. You know, those of you who, like my aide, goes out and does CrossFit all the time, you know, you're, you're not maybe able to meet the same body fat standards. And I know that there are women who every time they have to have, um, you know, weigh in or, or tape causes a significant amount of anxiety and then that causes other issues that um, are detrimental to health. So I think all of those things are things that we need to look at for um, those who are in our force as well as those who are impacted by our policies. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Staff Sergeant Lewis from the 120th SFS, also a part of the WIT. Um, I think my question is, how do I convey the importance of the WIT to our leadership? Like, we're in the Air National Guard, and they're like, it just doesn't fit into our readiness. Like, we have to focus on our readiness. We have to focus on the training. So they're making us have our meetings, like, at lunch or after drill, or we're really struggling to build our numbers and to, like, build programs. Like, we just got our first lactation rooms, and that was, like, a huge barrier. Like, we had to fight for that. We had to put in policies. We had to fight the budget. And even at the end, they only put in half our orders. So now this year we're having to put in the other half. Like, it's just... I think we're struggling to get that across leadership. Like this isn't like, you know, a club at the end of the day. This is important. This is something that we're going to do. So we need the time to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I know that that can be challenging, especially when you're trying to, to fit it into a, a drill weekend. One thing that I really appreciated that Mary O'Brien did during the time that, that she was the WIT champion was to come up with a framework that tied these initiatives to things like readiness and retention and risk. And I think the way that you can portray what the recommendations are according to that framework is really valuable. Because if you can say, I need this, and here is the impact on readiness, or here is why this is important to retention, you're much more likely to get the attention of senior leaders because those are the things they care about. They just might not have thought that this was a way to accomplish those objectives. Um, so I, I think that framework is really important. I, I also think finding who can be an ally to help you. Um, you know, can you find somebody who is a major, a lieutenant colonel, a colonel? If you're not getting the time you need with whoever is the big boss, who can help to carry your message with you and to say, I think that what they're doing is really important. Let's figure this out together. Um, but the more you can tie it to the things that we all need to care about, like retention, recruiting, risk, et cetera, um, the more compelling your story is going to be. Thank you, ma'am. Honorable Wagner, Brigadier General Lisa Craig, Deputy Commander, Air Force Recruiting. Great to see you again. <laughs> Recruiters. Um, the question I have, I'm in the twilight of my career, and, you know, you and I are a little bit more seasoned than, than many in the room. But I'm often asked, and I'll ask you this same question, and it relates a little bit to something you said earlier about aides and execs and something that the wing commander from uh, Goodfellow mentioned. And it had to do with how do we encourage and display and model that mentoring relationship, that it doesn't just have to be somebody that outranks us. Clearly, you're at the stage where few outrank you. Um, and how do we grow those networks where we are then in that position of sponsorship where we can set that up for ourselves so that our enlisted and officer force, our civilians, have that representation in the rooms that matter. How do we deliberately grow that and how have you done that in your career? Yeah, I, I think it's important to have people at a variety of different levels to either be sponsors for you or to give you feedback. Um, Sometimes people have come to me and say, will you mentor me? 
and it's not someone that I know well, so I can't give them feedback on their performance. I can only share lessons learned or insights or, you know, they can ask me questions about what do you think about this or that. So th there's value in those relationships from somebody that you don't know what it, really at all, but you're able to get some of their insights. Then you need people who can give you the honest truth about how you're performing. So uh, whether that's your supervisor or it's peers or, or others who can say, you know, here's another way to handle that, that it might come across better if you did this, or I would go for that opportunity or, or whatever it is, those people who really know you. Um, and then, and, and they can be at all different levels. It's helpful to have people who are, you know, kind of from the 360 perspective, people who work for you to give you feedback. I felt this way about this thing. Um, I, I didn't appreciate the way I was treated or uh, things like that. So we need to be receptive to feedback from, from all different directions. And then, like I mentioned earlier, having the people that are willing to sponsor you when you're not in the room and, and tee you up for those opportunities. Um, so we, we need to have those relationships at a variety of different levels. Um, the Department of the Air Force has some formal mentoring opportunities and there is value in that, but I think building your network in all of those different directions and being intentional about who can you build a relationship with and as senior leaders, you know, it's all looking sideways, looking down to see who do I want to reach out to? I think that's a responsibility that we have. If, if we see somebody that we see that potential, helping to figure out, well, how can I help you get there? What's standing in your way? And um, so I, I think whether it's for the employee, you know, civilian, airman, guardian, et cetera, being intentional, looking up and looking out to find those relationships. And then for senior leaders, and, and this is again, not just mentoring those who went to the same school or are, you know, fly in the same plane or whatever, but, but being more intentional about looking broadly um, to, to have those opportunities to mentor and sponsor others is really important. Thanks, ma'am. Okay, our last question. All right, good morning, ma'am. Major Nancy Neal. I'm a director of operations for a data mask unit. Um, so kind of already in the same vein that I was uh, going to ask my question, so I'll modify it a little bit. But you mentioned earlier having a round table with all uh, these higher ranking women and able to, being able to hear their stories. Um, obviously, symposiums like this are a great avenue to hear some stories from other great women and what they're doing. Um, but I think it would be very beneficial to hear those stories uh, from women at the tip top. Any suggestions for those of us that aren't down the hall or a phone call away to be able to have access um, to those other women and their stories from the tip top? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I need to think about that one a little bit. I would say when you have the opportunity to meet people from other locations to be intentional about using those opportunities. Um, but I've had people who have reached out to me, you know, after speaking at things like this and, and saying I could really use some advice. Um, you know, I, I think for most of us who are in leadership positions, we want to try to help when, when people reach out like that. Um, don't all of you send me an email tomorrow? That, that <laughs> might be difficult. But, you know, if somebody really needs something, find somebody who can help you and, and have that conversation with them. Teams helps a lot or, or other tools like that where you can have a, a virtual meeting if you're not in a place where you are finding the people that you need to talk to. Um, but, again, most senior leaders, when somebody says, I would really like to talk to you, can we set up an office call, a mentoring session or whatever, we'll try to find a way to fit that in. And, and so, again, that's easier if they're down the hall. Um, so whether it's when you go to school, when you go to TDY, when you're on a deployment, whatever it might be, trying to find those opportunities. And if not, then, then seeking out folks and, and reaching out to them. And I think most will give you a positive response um, because they do want to help. Thank you. Madam Secretary, on behalf of the uh, WASP, we uh, definitely appreciate your time, insight, and uh, perspective. Uh, I, I, you know, I want to say that uh, all the information you passed on is definitely inputs that we all can uh, leverage uh, as we carry forward. But uh, it's been an honor and privilege to have you here today. Well, thank you all for having me, and, and thank you for those who put on this conference. I think it's so important um, to be able to get together and talk about these issues. So I hope you have a great time these next two days, and thank you for all you do and your service to our great country.
We're going to go ahead and reset the room. Uh, we're going to take a 10-minute break, and at 9.25, we'll ki uh, kick off the next uh, panel. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a couple of notes for you. This is the two minute mark. At noon today at the Hub, the registration will be open for anyone who did not have the chance to do so. And lastly, if you need to leave the auditorium during the live broadcast, please note you will not be allowed to enter back into the room. Thank you. Welcome everyone, we're ready for our next panel. I am Colonel Michaela Broncado, Coma commander of the 217th Air Operations Group in Battle Creek, Michigan, Air National Guard. My, thank you. My former job was uh, the DAF WPS Program Manager in the Pentagon, and I'm so honored to be here with you all to introduce our next speaker, Major Kimberly Bruschi. So a lot of times in my last job, I got asked, Colonel B, why WPS? And for those of you, if it's Women, Peace, and Security for the first time, don't worry. We have another panel in, coming up in a few to give you a little bit more background on that. But a lot of times I would get asked by our senior leaders in the Pentagon of, you know, we're very busy. We have a lot going on. How do we include this into what we're already doing? And I think this panel is going to help with highlighting some of that. This truly is a competitive advantage for our forces, and our adversaries and competitors are not looking at it the same. So, Major Kimberly Bruschi, she is the Director currently of Operations for Space Delta 10 here at the United States Air Force Academy, where she facilitates Delta 10's role as the lead for space concepts, tactics, and doctrine, thereby ensuring that the U.S. Space Force continues to evolve its warfighting philosophy to meet contemporary operational and strategic challenges. But what I think is so cool about Kim is she was one of the first inner service transfers into the Space Force from the United States Army, where she served in many diverse and trailblazing roles, including field artillery officer, where she learned about the, fi the 105 and 155 millimeter howitzer. I think that's very cool. She was one of our first volunteer females to attend the experimental cultural support team where she deployed and did over 60 combat patrols in that role. Um, she also deployed forward to the United Arab Emirates as a Patriot Missile Battery Commander. Uh, she was an assistant professor position at the United States Military Academy at West Point. And again, during her time at Army Air Command and Staff College, she studied as one of the Art of War scholars, specifically studying um, on this topic, as well as um, how to uh, retain women in the military, um, especially in ground combat inclusion policy that the Army had lifted in 2016. So I am so fired up to welcome her to the stage, and we're Excited to hear from you and your questions as well. So, Kim, will you welcome me? Hello. All right, we're ready to get started. Let's get started, ma'am. And I did forget in the intro to um, also say that you're expecting your first. So, we're I am. excited to have you. <laughs> it's not just the camera, it's it's the baby. So, <laughs> awesome. So, will you please tell us a little bit about how you got connected to studying and learning about this topic and how these perspectives relate to women, peace, and security? Oh, absolutely. So, first, ma'am, thank you so much for the, for the kind introduction. I've had a very interesting career. Um, serving with, uh, as a cultural support team member with 3rd Special Forces Group in Afghanistan, 
I witnessed firsthand the impact of women as red, blue, and green actors as both passive civilians and active participants in, com uh, in conflict. And it ignited this passion to study women, peace, and security as I so often saw the overlooked role of women as being really critical to counterinsurgency operations. Uh, and later in my career, like you said, I was selected to be an Art of War scholar at the uh, Army Command and General Staff College, where my thesis focused on behavioral science topics uh, and women, peace, and security, namely the retention of women in combat arms, like you mentioned. Uh, and during this program, I was exposed to historical and contemporary strategy in the Indo-Pacific. And I became really interested in how women, peace, and security enhances or undermines an actor's role in great power competition, uh, which leads me to my time now, recent times, uh, where my interests have led me to partner with the Air Force Special Operations School, where I guest lecture on Chinese grand strategy and China-Taiwan relations. I love that. Are we fired up for this today, everybody? Like, very fired up. Okay, so if we go to your next slide, we'll talk more about the importance of operations and knowing our competitors. Like, why is it important for us to know ourselves and then also to know what a country like China is thinking about gender? Yeah. So China is seen by many scholars as a patriarchal and a patrilineal society. That is a, a male-oriented hierarchy with, uh, with the responsibility for men to perpetuate familial lines while women fulfill supportive roles. And historically, China has been a male-centered society, uh, and women were to be governed by the three obediences. That is one, as an unmarried woman, she must obey her father and brothers. Two, as a married woman, she must obey her husband. And three, as a widow, she must obey her, her uh, adult sons. Educating women was seen as a waste unless it was purposed to make uh, good wives and mothers. After all, as the old saying went, uh, too much learning does not become a virtuous woman. Now, things drastically changed by 1949. A lot of people don't know this. Uh, with the founding of the People's Republic of China, Mao Zedong says, uh, quote, women can hold up half the sky. End quote. And, and thus, women were given the ideologically sanctioned opportunity to pursue equal rights as men. Uh, and laws were passed to ban things like uh, concubinages, uh, arranged marriages, and uh, prostitution and child marriages. Women were also encouraged to enter the labor force to bolster the Chinese economy. Uh, but by 1979, the one-child policy is put into place which was a birth control policy to control the consequences of uh, a growing Chinese population on its economy and its resources. Uh, by 2016, that increased to the two-child policy, 2021, the, the three-child policy. However, the one-child policy, in, in my humble opinion, is the catalyst to much of what we see in forming Chinese gender dynamics today. So just keep a pin in that, ma'am. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party has been in power for 75 years and they still rely on a Confucian approach to gender roles uh, in their embracement of patriarchal authoritarianism, uh, reinforcing uh, traditional gender roles. In 2016, uh, President Xi Jinping pledged that traditional family values uh, would be reinforced as part of the CCP's effort to enhance virtue and civility. Uh, because of this, the, the CCP stifled feminist movements and the CCP sees the modern crisis of masculinity as a peril, they say peril, to the security of, of the nation. Uh, despite the CCP's support of uh, women's participation in labor, it's, it's more for economic development, more so than equal rights. Uh, women are still disproportionately represented in high-level employment sectors and still bear the pressure and responsibility of traditional feminine roles like house and child care. Uh, gender essentialism is prevalent, uh, meaning that gender is dichotomous uh, and issues of equality are, are clearly binary, uh, usually translated in Chinese as nanu, nanu pingdang, which means equality between man and woman, 
versus Jingdei Pingdong, which means gender equality. So this means issues related to uh, LGBTQIA plus or gender minorities aren't seen as issues of equality. But China still boasts themselves a model for gender equality. Uh, in 1995, this is interesting, the, the fourth conference on women in Beijing was hosted by China, and this led to the passing of the WPS agenda in 2000. But many describe China as performative uh, in their treatment of women domestically uh, in order to suit specific needs. So the Olympics, for example, uh, China's use of the Olympics to project a certain public image through propaganda, well known. Uh, examples specific to this, uh, having a female minority, uh, female ethnic minority athlete, a Uyghur athlete, she lit the Olympic cauldron. Um, or Chinese tennis star Peng Shua, she rescinded her accusations of rape conducted by a member of the CCP. Um, in 2015, China co-hosted the 20th anniversary of that Beijing World Conference on Women by hosting a UN summit in New York. But during this time, uh, CCP leaders quietly arrested leaders of a feminist movement in China. Uh, they were called the Feminist Five for planning an event on International Women's Day where they were to distribute stickers about sexual harassment. Uh, so many Chinese feminists have uh, moved abroad to move out from under the red iron thumb uh, and to spread the word of Chinese human rights violations to international audiences. Uh, and the CCP have described those women as having, you know, quote unquote, uh, colluded with hostile Western forces. You know, and, and why is China doing this? Uh, because part of, chi of China's national grand strategy is to provide a clear, viable alternative model to the Western way of governance. That's all so fascinating. So when we talk specifically, though, about the security sector, how do these gender perspectives impact Chinese women in the military or in other security roles? Sure. So these, these gender perspectives result in a limited role for uh, Chinese women in the military and security sectors. Uh, women make up about 4.5% of the Chinese military despite representing 48% of the population. So this is in comparison to the US military where representation's about 20% with similar statistics across the country. Um, although these numbers could be a little different, um, I'll be you know, quite transparent about that as there is very little um, or no like publicly available knowledge on these statistics by design. Uh, but since we are at the Women's Air and Space Power Symposium, I thought I'd share some uh, interesting facts about the People's Liberation Army Air Force specific to women, um, which if we could go to the next slide, um, give you something to look at besides me. So there's your, there's your fun facts. You can digest those, my fellow guardians and my, my air people. Um, so in, in addition, no Chinese women hold any senior command or political commissar positions, and rarely have women represented more than 10% of the 300-member uh, uh, Chinese Communist Party Central Committee. Uh, only six have ever served in the Politburo, which is the highest governing body of the CCP Central Committee. And as of October 2022, following the 20th Party Congress, no women are now serving in the Politburo. Um, China has posted to the United uh, Nations Security Council their contributions of women to UN peacekeeping operations, uh, having deployed more than 1,000 uh, female peacekeeping officers and soldiers in support of UN missions. However, allegedly, it, you know, they're accused of doing it with pragmatic intent to gain legitimacy. Uh, while those women fulfill uh, gender essentialist roles, such as you know, medical and, and administrative roles. Now, give them some credit. There has been some marginal effort to, to train women in combat roles in the Chinese military. The PLA trained its first 16 female fighter jet pilots uh, in 2009. However, I say however a lot, however, largely and allegedly, 
China is more interested in using this empowered role of women to propagate a state media controlled agenda. And the institution of, they call it the talent segment of the People's Liberation Army for PLA female soldiers, it puts them in publicity positions and administrative positions, uh, which silos them to support uh, roles versus combat. Yeah, again, very interesting. Uh, in light of this info, what are some of the results of not taking this into account as we, as a force, look at gender-related considerations, like in our planning? Yeah. So let's, let's go back to the one-child policy and how I said it was the catalyst to much of what we see in forming Chinese gender dynamics today. Uh, well, this catalyst has had an effect on Chinese national security uh, and by with U.S. national security. So China's one-child policy was or is successful at its core of restricting Chinese population growth uh, to the point that the, by 2019, the national birth rate fell below um, its lowest level uh, in 30 years. Um, however, again, however, again, what was not considered were the secondary repercussions of such a restrictive policy, such as an imbalanced sex ratio. Um, male versus women. So the total number of excess males in China is estimated to reach 41.41 million by 2043. It's a lot of men. Uh, this situation is seen by many as a threat to social stability uh, due to the increase in crime, and in particular, what I want to focus on, uh, sex trafficking, uh, human trafficking. The, the U.S. State Department uh, categorizes China as tier three for human trafficking, meaning they are not compliant with the minimum standard, nor are they making any significant effort to do so. Uh, also to be clear, because the numbers are, again, once, once again skewed, uh, Chinese anti-trafficking laws do not account for forced marriages, illegal adoptions, and forced labor, so the number could actually be higher. Uh, the disparate sex ratio in China increases the risk of sex trafficking as the surplus of single men exacerbates this issue of, of buying women for marriage, uh, especially in minority prevalent regions, like where we see the Uyghurs, um, in areas with North Korean defectors, uh, as well as uh, neighboring countries like Myanmar. So in addition to the increase in sex trafficking, uh, the one-child policy has decreased the fertility rate uh, of the country below the replacement level needed to sustain a stable population. Uh, what does this mean? It leads to an aging population uh, and this demographic imbalance where you know, a smaller working pool is, is supporting a larger elderly population, uh, which has effects on economic prosperity, uh, so Chinese social welfare programs, and health resources. So you know, this, this reduced birth rate has created a shrinking labor force, uh, and that does pose a challenge for sustained economic growth in China. And I think we, we see that in the news right now. Right? They're, they're struggling a little bit. Even with the lifting of the one-child policy, you know, couples are just not interested in China of, you know, of having multi-child families, uh, especially women. Women do not want to take on the unequal burden of child care responsibilities, especially as there are still stigmas of, of child care and the workplace, not a foreign concept to us even in the United States. Um, according to a 2022 online survey of professional uh, working Chinese women uh, conducted by a Chinese job search website, only 0.8% of respondents said that they were interested in having three children. So couples are just unwilling to have three children, uh, one for gender inequality as well as the rising cost of living. Uh, and in fact, and this is really interesting, uh, many, if you look up like many Ch Chinese feminist blogs um, and a couple news sites have reported on this, many women are choosing to protest gender equality uh, by deliberately choosing to delay or reject child, uh, childbirth and, and marriage. Yeah, and to that point, uh, when I was introduced to Women, Peace, and Security and PME in residence and wrote a paper uh, studying Japan, 
they, in their national action plan, had wanted to try to fix, you know, more women in leadership, but found that some of the barriers were also child care, elder care, and so, again, important that we can fix this for us to be able to serve at our best and be most ready, so. Absolutely, and on that note, um, sorry I'm going off, off kilter a little bit, but if you looked at the, you know, uh, President Putin of Russia, you know, his latest message on um, International Women's Day, right, he, he talks about, you know, the calling of women to, to have babies, so this isn't just conducive to, to China, this is a problem, um, you know, it's, it's a responsibility of women to have babies, um, and, and China's dealing with the same thing. In fact, they, they publicly endorsed President Putin's uh, message. And I loved hearing an international panel. It was one of the Air Force members from Chile, and she was asked, what are they doing in their country for maternity, paternity policy? And her response was, we look at it as the right of the child, not the right of the birth parent or the, um, the other family members. So I, I found that really interesting. That we can learn from our other partner nations as well. Yeah. Okay, moving on to your next uh, question, and then we're excited to hear from all of you. But um, I really could listen to you all day on this. Um, but as we move more towards our great power competition and how it relates to women, peace, and security implementation, um, what would you say, how, how do we connect these dots? Right, all this great information, what can we do with it? So we're going to, all together, we're going to take all this information, and it's, it's a lot of information. Uh, China in 30 minutes is, is, is quite a feat. Yeah, there's some big, quite a feat. big, large books on the reading list. So, yeah. um, shout out to uh, the Air Force Special Ops School. Come attend my classes and their classes. Um, but let's, let's take all this information and place it under the umbrella of the, the three big words looming over all of us in the defense and security sectors. Great power competition. Uh, bottom line up front, ma'am. Uh, women, peace, security, it matters. And you, I'm pointing to the audience in cyberspace, right? You as leaders you know, need to be consulting with your gender advisors and your gender focal points. A great power competition the goal is to increase parity to shape and influence global security architectures. And this necessitates a stable nation, meaning, you know, a, a nation that can steward resources to provide basic and essential human needs to their population. Um, the recently published U.S. Strategy and National Action Plan on Women, Peace, and Security, it very clearly states that the status of women in society and the stability of the nation are inextricably linked, uh, meaning, you know, the higher levels of gender equality, the more prosperous and secure a nation is. Um. <laughs> Yes, I love it. Uh, I don't know who that was, but yes. Woo. Implementing WPS and a gender perspective is a critical part of this. And we as a nation and our partners and our allies, especially in the Indo-Pacific, have the responsibility to model like sustainable peace and uh, security and economic stability to the rest of the world. You know, I, it's about, you know, in this great power competition, it's about as, you know, I've read in the strategy bridge, you know, that, that thin margin of excellence, you know, that, that edge, this gives us the edge. You know, and China, I already told you China supported Russia. Uh, they also supported Russia in their challenge of the 2020 Women, Peace, and Security Agenda, which watered down core issues such as women's human rights, uh, conflict-related sexual violence, uh, and principles of the 2000 Agenda uh, to include uh, women's meaningful participation in all aspects of peace and security. So despite its strain on women, the CCP reinforces these traditional gen, uh, gender roles, um, yet outwardly they, you know, they promote equality. And while they have made you know, progress in several areas, such as increased uh, participation of women in labor, uh, China sees WPS as a foreign policy matter, more so than a domestic focus. Um, unless used as a tool to gain international visibility. And I'm going to draw the circle around some people, right? This is not unlike other nations who also view women, peace, and security as just a means to conflict resolution, as a component of a foreign aid and development agenda for other 
countries. Uh, China is not focused on doing any of this through their bilateral programs or their Chinese initiated programs such as the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, this differs from other countries with a WPS agenda such as the uh, United States and Australia who are making strides towards implementing the pillars of you know, Resolution 1325, uh, so participation, protection, prevention, and relief and recovery. So what results from this sustained uh, gender perspective on Chinese society with authoritarian involvement by the CCP is a vast, you know, half of the population in China, right, untapped resource of, of human capital. And this is a precursor to social instability, which Kim argues is the center of gravity to uh, China's national grand strategy. And that instability has marked uh, sociocultural and economic consequences. Uh, to, to dichotomously see war as this business of dangerous men and helpless women is, is absolutely invalid. Uh, history has proven women to be security assets, uh, filling gaps unfillable by men, or threats. So take into account um, the threat of Chinese women choosing not to procreate. You know, to choose not to have babies, you know, to forcibly age out a population is, is a weaponization of a natural function of womanhood, you know, in accordance with traditional Chinese gender perspectives. Uh, so these women don't really sound that helpless, you know, do they? Uh, understanding all of these dynamics is, is absolutely a strategic and moral imperative, as stated by the Biden administration. Uh, so... Now, I promise I'm almost done closing up here. Uh, China is China seeks to provide a credible alternative model to the West. I've said that already. You know, Chinese aid in the Indo-Pacific, they it does not have any dedicated programs to advance women's rights. Thus, the the United States and our nation, our allies and partners in in the region, you know, have an opportunity to to edge out that that thin margin of excellence by deliberately conducting gender analysis, by implementing these types of, you know, outputs, you know, on our strategies, and then operationalizing those pillars of, of women, peace, and security. You know, our, our continued and, and future support of WPS can serve as counterpoints to China's authoritarianism and their influence, which have allowed them to become such a powerful regional and arguably global leader. Um, we can undermine their efforts and, you know, and continue to be the, you know, the prototype for, you know, peace, stability, and, and democracy. And to your points, I think we've seen this in um, the Ukraine conflict where uh, gender is weaponized, and we've also seen it in the Middle East, in the Israel-Gaza, where a lot of displaced women, children, I think there was over 60,000 pregnant women that could not give birth. So, again, but I think What's also very important is that we don't just look at women, peace, and security as an international for others. We have to look at ourselves and how we model to be able to, you know, help help others. So I'm really excited to hear your questions. I think we're ready for that. So what do you guys have for us? Be cognizant of our time, too. All right, I think I see somebody over here ready to ask. I think you're there now. I think it's, I think you're there. Oh. Oh. That is a great question. Yeah, so I'll start. So, um, so I work in Space Delta 10. So my, my mission's a little unique maybe compared to yours, but I'll also share mine. So Space Delta 10, we, uh, we do a lot, you know, doctrine, concepts, tactics, war games, uh, and um, 
you could be asking, like, how do you apply a gendered perspective on, on that? So, you know, I guess the first thing, right, when you think about the pillars, women, peace, and security, right, one of the pillars is, is representation, right? So I guess first, in any of your planning processes for all those really important missions you're doing, right, you come in AFRICOM, who's in the room? And, you know, this is, and when I usually talk about women, peace, and security, I make a point to dispel the myth that this is about tokenism, right, you know, and, and, and DEI initiatives to, like, force people into places where they don't belong, right? First of all, we belong in these conversations, right? But, you know, first, are you, are you actually getting a diverse perspective? And I'm not just talking about how many women are in your planning process, right? Like, women, peace, and security, one of the other myths, I think, is that it's, it's focused just on women. It's about a gendered perspective, right? And you can apply that to, you know, insert any, you know, number of different demographics, right? Are you getting a, you know, diverse, diversity of thought when you're in your planning processes? And that's something that's important to us, you know, in Delta 10 when we think about, you know, how do we approach, you know, writing doctrine? You know, who's part of these writing groups? You know, who's shaping how we conduct space operations in the future, either through doctrine concepts or tactics? Uh, so I'm going to, I'll pause there, ma'am, so you can have, you know, your part, but I would start first with, with representation. Yeah, and thank you to all of our men in the room, and for that question, um, we definitely need the male allyship, because what I've learned through this, um, yeah, you can totally no, really, yeah, that's, the guy. that's really cool, so. Yeah. <laughs> Is that any time you look at an underrepresented population, and there are some functions where men are the underrepresented population. For example, I learned very quickly in my uh, current assignment that I have some single dads in my organization. And as we looked at their family care plans, maybe not as robust as we need them to be, and I unfortunately could not deploy one, um, that there are instances where our guys are underrepresented. So we got to look at this from both aspects. But to answer your question specifically, um, and I'm very excited for the panel coming up because we'll get into a little bit more of this, but uh, right now I'm helping with implementing this out at the unit level. We've seen women, peace, and security start at the combatant commands, academia, and now at the headquarters and um, all of our services. But now it's time to scale this and duplicate it out in our functions. Um, and so I think specifically things that you can look at, um, I know in our unit we looked at um, a baseline of gender, like what Kim was talking about, of you know, do we have across officer enlisted civilian, by rank, by AFSC or specialty, um, we just you look at that from a you know baseline. Then you start to look at what is our makeup of our exercise teams, our deployments, uh, folks applying and attending PME and residents, things that are going to build our competitiveness for senior leadership. So we start to look at that, and that's a little bit more at our kind of our recruiting, our attention, our development of our force. When we look at facilities, like do we have any barriers for service in our facilities at large? In our unit, we looked at our locker rooms. Um, it was built off of an old um, mechanic shop, and so the women's restroom was much smaller than the men's, and I had all the women's clothes, winter clothes, on the floor, and we were trying to figure out how do we expand our locker rooms, and so you know we couldn't expand the actual bathroom locker room itself, so we added lockers so that all of our members had a place to hang their jacket. You know, simple stuff like that to, you know, fitment. And again, thanks, a shout out to our WIT team um, and those that have been working barrier analysis, working groups for all represented populations that have looked at things like flight equipment, our defenders, our body armor, um, things that will help us in our deployment. But I think that there's a lot of different things we can do. And when you, if those of you that are signed up for the gender analysis breakout, we'll actually do a little hands-on to be able to get after that. But it's going to look different for every AOR, for every mission. Um, and again, as long as we put on the gender lens, and that's one of these things, this is not an add-on program. This is something you add into your planning process. Hope that helped. Awesome. Good morning, ma'am. Captain Kayla Hamilton from the 479 Student Squadron at NAS Pensacola. Um, considering the repercussions of the one child policy and Can the I aging, have you bring your mic down a little yeah, sorry, bit? Sorry, I was an artillery officer. I, yeah. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah, maintenance. Right. Right. So, uh, considering the one child policy and the repercussions of that with the aging society, do you think or do you believe China will change its views 
on in the next, you know, 10, 15, 20 years? And if so, do you think it'll be more of a reluctance of like, hey, this is what the population we have, or would it be, you know, fully on board with kind of the West as their ideals kind of show the rest of the world that it's not working? I love that question. Yeah, so you, you're tapping into my concluding comments, so thanks. <laughs> Sorry, um, She's ahead of the game, I like it. So now I've got to think really quickly about what else I want to talk about. Um, yeah, but no, excellent question. Uh, you know, and I didn't get really into this uh, in, in the main talk, but yeah, what are some of those additional repercussions of, of an aging out population? Um, yeah, I do think that this, this will affect uh, China's actions. Uh, again, Kim's opinion. I'm just an amateur Chinese scholar, right? But um, I do think this will affect their timeline. So right now, like the idea of a surplus of, you know, of 41 million excess men, that sounds really good from a military planning standpoint. Right, that's a that's a lot of dudes um, that can go to war for you, right? And that's something that I think you know us as a strategic planners we think a lot about, right? What is the that ratio? You know, the desired combat ratio is minimum three to one, right? Um, you know, green to, to red forces. Uh, but all right, what are some of the the other implications of this? Um, you know, when it when it comes to to China's potential actions. So one, right, a stagnated Chinese economy, right? Um, you know. That, that's going to put some pressure on the Chinese Communist Party, right? Uh, the, they've been able to, um, you know, make you know come through on a bunch of their promises of achieving the China dream, right? We, you know, they become respected. They're they're overcoming the hundred years of humiliation, all this kind of stuff. Um, great, but now their economy is stagnating, so they're not making the money they used to. Um, their their population's aging out, you know, and now the resources are going to dwindle. That, in my opinion, is going to accelerate a timeline for potential aggressive Chinese actions, right, where they, w they may be willing to, you know, cross the threshold of armed conflict, especially if they have this surplus of young single men. And what does that mean for us, right? There's this concern now of, you know, not only would we have to fight a surplus of, of, of men if, if, you know, we rise above the level of armed conflict, but what kind of men? These men aren't married. They don't have children. Right? They don't necessarily have a future in accordance with traditional Chinese perspectives. Right? That's very scary because we have a lot to fight for, you know, as soldiers, airmen, marines, sailors, guardians. Um, if they don't, that also changes the dynamic of, of, or the nature of war if, if we get there. So I hope that, that starts to illuminate some stuff for you. And I guess I would add to that is I hope that our competitors are listening and that women all over the world will have equal opportunity to be able to thrive. Um, but I also think it's important for us to understand that that is a competitive advantage for us. When we look at our recruiting, our attention, um, being able to tap into all different perspectives, all different types of thought. Um, and I also think it's very important that we don't lose sight. I know even when we started building the program in the Pentagon, WPS started in SAF-IA as an international affairs program. And it was very quickly recognized by their gender advisors there that this is bigger than just with our partners. We have to look at how we model this in our own operations and exercises, how it impacts our readiness uh, so that we can be more lethal, really, and more effective. So um, I, I think, and again, not just in that region, but all over the world, this, this came out of the UN Security Council resolution, several resolutions to um, continue to build the program, and it is a mandated congressional program for the Department of Defense, USAID, Department of Homeland Security, and the Department of State. And I think you'll start to see more of it, too, um, mm -hmm. in uh, writing, in, in the application. So we're, we're very excited to see it grow. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. All right, so I think we have one question and then we got to wrap it up. Uh, good morning, uh, Captain Elena Kissler from the 138th uh, Electromagnetic Warfare Squadron. Come on close detail. to your, ma your mic, my friend. Thank you. Okay, thank you. There Can you, you hear me better? Yes. Okay, so I'm Captain Elena Kissler from the 138th Electromagnetic Warfare Squadron on detail to headquarters SPOC at S4. And my question is um, about messaging. So uh, how might the messaging of the WPS efforts and ideas that be shared with units that do not have a TFI associations and are more isolated, such as Air National Guard units um, who have low turnover and not a lot of interaction with active duty, so that they might also integrate into this mindset and culture and maintain the competitive edge? 
Such a good question, ma'am. I, I feel like you have a lot of experience in this space, so I will. I could talk all day, but I, I'm going to cut into everybody's break if I take too long. But I will tell you is we're working really hard um, across total force, uh, across the air and space, and we're working really hard with our other branches as well. Um, I'm really proud of the Army, who um, they've made a lot of progress just in this last year implementing WPS. So I think you'll start to see more of it. Um, we're working right now on some checklists to make it very user friendly, because again, a lot of gender focal points, gender advisors are doing this as an additional duty, just out of passion to want to uh, help and make progress. So you'll start to see some more checklists of where do you begin, how do you use tools like Envision to pull data to be able to get your baseline, um, and then how do we actually implement this into planning processes. You're going to start to see it in curriculum. Uh, Air University is bringing this online. Um, again, not adding on blocks. It's being uh, integrated to what we're already doing. That was actually when we briefed uh, Simsaf Bass. She's like, hey, we got to put this into what we're already doing because we're already maxed out. But I think you'll start to see more of it. But it's really uh, finding some familiarization about it so you guys are all learning about it and then trying to apply it to your own units and functions. And remember, this doesn't have to come from above. This can be grassroots. This can be things you do in your own planning at all levels of leadership. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, bottom line, you know, WPS, is, it's a foreign policy tool. It's a planning tool. It's not independent of the things that we're already doing, and I think that's the big misconception for leaders. Like, oh, this is another thing we have to do. It should be just as seamless as, you know, looking for key terrain or, under, or finances or understanding, you know, science, the science and technology behind a certain weapon system. It's another planning tool. Um, so that, that, that's what I would like you to walk away with. And uh, I just am so thankful that you have studied this and you're sharing it with us. And hopefully that gives our audience something to think more about or do some research on. And again, thank you everyone for your questions and your attention today. And we'll look forward to, we're going to take now another 10 minute break to reset the stage for our next panel. Um, and we'll look forward to seeing you back here uh, soon. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, and distinguished panelists, my name is Lieutenant Katie Scheidner, and it is my honor to introduce to you an exceptional group of leaders who are at the forefront of innovation in the Air and Space Forces in the STEM and cyber domains. First, we have Colonel Heidi Dexter, Commander of Space Base Delta II at Buckley Space Force Base, whose leadership and expertise in space operations are paramount in shaping the future of our space endeavors. Joining us next is Dr. Michelle Grudreau, Space Operations Command Chief Scientist, whose pioneering work in science and technology is instrumental in pushing the boundaries of what is possible in air and space. <laughs> Lastly, we have Ms. Kathy Reed, the Spark Division Deputy for AFWorks and former Chief Innovation Officer for the 96th Test Swing whose innovative spirit and vision continue to drive transformative change within our organizations. Join me in welcoming them all. And for those of us joining online, please feel free to send your questions via the chat. We'll address them as they come in and, if time permits, at the end of our session. For the live audience, there will be an opportunity this afternoon to engage directly with the panel. So please note that we won't be able to accommodate any live questions from the in-person audience unless uh, time permits given the online questions. So now let us dive into some thought-provoking discussions starting with the key factors driving successful innovation. The first question will be for all the panelists. So panelists, in your opinion, what are the key factors driving successful innovation in our air and space forces and the STEM and cyber domains? How can we encourage and cultivate these factors to foster even greater innovation? Dr. Goudreau, we'll start with you. Thank you. Is it on? Okay, cool. All right. 
Yeah, General Miller wasn't kidding about the lights. <laughs> So basically, one point I would make is that successful innovation relies on leadership enabling innovation. You know, people can't be innovated if they're tied to a checklist or have to say, mother may I, every time they want to try something new. So how do we get our people, you know, we need to enable them to be innovative. You can't, you can't mandate it. You have to enable it. Thank you, Dr. Goudreau. Ms. Reed? I think there are three attributes that I think about in this space, and that is the first one to me is relationship building. You know, how do we use those relationships to go after the wicked problems? Like currently right now I'm advising a team on how do we increase our speed and decrease our costs associated with getting an authority to operate so that we can put software on our networks. And these are just one of the many wicked problems that we address. Another particular area I think is important is active listening. It's really important that we start to listen to understand what the problems are so that we can articulate the value proposition. And that value proposition allows us to relentlessly pursue that trans transformational change so that we can do this without a fear of failure, which is something that stops us many times. The last part of the answer for me is a safe space. How to create a space where learning can occur we can take that and create a trusted workspace with our leadership who understands the value of failure and what we can learn from it so that we can then set expectations for each individual as an airman and a guardian to be able to look beyond their perceived individual limits because only when we fail can we truly understand what our limits are. Thank you. And Colonel Dexter? I think my answer incorporates both of your points. Um, I think curiosity drives innovation, and I'm very appreciative of AFWorks and SSC and AFMC and all of those larger programs that are looking towards what's next and what should we be doing better or differently. But I think frustration also drives innovation. Um, so we need to have that spa safe space for our airmen, guardians, soldiers, sailors, Marines um, to understand the problem set that's in front of them and feel empowered to act. So not just checklist driven, but they understand the boundaries of what they can and can't do um, and feel empowered to get out and make a change and make a difference. And that can be increasingly difficult to do in a military organization that is very hierarchical, hi hierarchy has a military hierarchy uh, and can make it very difficult for people to question the status quo and why. So we need to create that safe space where people are saying there must be a better, faster, cheaper way to do this and creating that space where they have um, the leverage to try and get after those wicked problems that you spoke to. Thank you all for your insights. Now, keeping on the theme of innovation, Ms. Reed, your experience spans both government service and the private sector where you've been instrumental in driving innovation and advancing technological capabilities. Given this unique perspective, what are some key differences you've observed in the approach to innovation between the two sectors? And moreover, how do you leverage insights from both domains to foster a more dynamic and effective innovation ecosystem within the Department of the Air Force, ensuring that it remains at the forefront of technological advancement, advancement and mission success? Wow, that's a lot. So. Um, <laughs> I would say, to kind of understand where I came from, so I grew up as an Air Force military dependent. I then went into industry after graduating college for 20 years. And then the last 15, I've been a civil servant in the Department of Defense. So I think with all of that background, um, what, I would find, what I found was that in industry, the tools were easy to access compared to what they are within the government. The computers were faster, at least pre-COVID. Now I'd say we came pretty close to catching up. And hiring only took one to two weeks. Imagine that world. So <laughs> those are the big differences I see in how we're trying to get after this. And I can tell you when I first started the innovation space, it was in 2017, I got a call after doing it about a year and they said, we opened the gates and you seem to be the only one that went out and like just took off running. What made you move so fast? The answer was easy. I didn't know I couldn't. No one told me I shouldn't. So I just did it. I didn't let my um, kind of perception of my limitations drive me. I just, they told me to be relentless, my leadership did, so I took them at their word and I just pursued until I was apprehended as uh, <laughs> how you've been told, pursue until apprehended, so I do that. Thank you, Ms. Reed. And now for the group. As the landscape of air and space operations continues to evolve, what key areas or capabilities do you believe will be the primary focus for the air and space forces in the coming years? We can begin with you, Colonel Dexter. 
Okay, I think that's a great question. Um, I grew up in an Air Force uh, that was focused on an overseas contingency operation, so the fight was very much downrange and over there. Um, I'm a cyber operator by trade, uh, so I have to stay true to my roots and say I think cyber. Um, I think cyber is absolutely critical uh, to shaping the next domain and shaping uh, what the next fight looks like. So securing our infrastructure, and that's not just that which resides on a military installation, but also our partnerships uh, with public sectors as well. So I'm going to stay true to my roots and say securing the cyber domain. Thank you. And Dr. Goudreau? I think I agree with everything she said, and I would add communication, especially the communication of data and information, because it underlies everything that we do in air and space. So gathering the data, the sensing, and processing it into information or intel is equally important. And also go on with that active listening, it plays into that, I believe. So I agree. Uh, cyber was one of my first listed. Uh, systems engineering is my background, so I'll, I'll stay true to that. But also there's other networks we need to be concerned about. Our financial networks, our energy networks. There's a lot of different attributes that can be targeted, and we need to be ready for that. I learned when I went and did a fellowship out in industry for two months, and I was embedded within a digital company, that we don't have the digital foundation we need to support our artificial intelligence, our autonomy, and our machine learning, and also the predictive analysis. So in order to develop this, we really need to focus on those particular uh, digital foundations, and then we need to be able to automate our decision making because we have data coming at us so fast that we need to be able to act upon it. So how do we automate that using this digital foundation? I think those are the key technologies. Thank you all. And so Dr. Goudreau. The I just wanted to oh, add yeah. just one point Please. about data. Yeah. You say that we have a lot of data coming at us, but we don't have the right kind of data and enough of the right kind of data to actually train the artificial intelligence that we're trying to implement. So I, that's, I think that's so key. Thank you. And, and Dr. Goudreau, the, the next question will actually be for you. So uh, your career has seen you play pivotal roles in both government and academia, contributing significantly to advancements in space technology and research. Considering your vast experience, what do you believe are the most pressing challenges or opportunities facing space operations and research today? And how do you envision addressing or capitalizing on them to propel us into the future of space exploration? Oh, well, vast experience. What I do is my chain. <laughs> you make me feel really old. <laughs> but, but I believe one of our most pressing challenges is deterrence in space. So I don't really have any answers for you. I just have more questions. Um, how do we defend and protect space without being the aggressor and weaponizing it? And how do we avoid or mitigate an arms race in space? Right? If we lose space, well, we, we lose a lot, right? I mean, how are you guys going to get home? <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Goudreau. So now that we've touched on both innovation and advancements in technology, I think we would all like to learn more about how leadership plays into this. Colonel Dexter, your leadership at Space Space Delta II involves overseeing operations critical to the United States Space Force's missions, including missile warning, missile tracking, and intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance. With the growing importance of space assets in national security, how do you prioritize readiness and resilience in the face of emerging threats and challenges? And how do you foster collaboration and coordination among the diverse units and organizations at Space Base Delta II to ensure seamless support for space operations worldwide? There are a lot of factors to that question. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Space Force, uh, Space Base Delta II is located up at Buckley. I have 117 mission partners on the installation, uh, largely falling into that missile warning, missile defense, intelligence, and cyber arena. Um, but we also have some guard members. We have um, reserve on the installation. We have all six services represented across the installation to include international partners. Uh, so total force installation, joint service installation. Um, so I would say that relationships matter. Understanding what each organization brings to the fight and how we at Space Base Delta II support them is absolutely critical to making sure that they have the tools that they need to get after their mission set. So I've heard General Whiting refer to the Space Base Delta as the power projection platform of space operations. So understanding that everything that we do and what my organization brings is critical to their fight. I'm not going to say that I know all 117. Please don't ask me to name them. 
um, but getting out across the installation and understanding the needs of each installation or each organization is absolutely critical to their success. Thank you. So now returning to all the panelists, as leaders advocating for diversity and inclusivity, how do you ensure that innovative ideas from all perspectives are heard and valued? And Dr. Goudreau, we can start with you. So I want to tell a little story. I'm into stories. Uh, I once noticed in, that in my office of only four people, my boss always spoke the least of any of us. Right? And so I, when I pointed it out to my boss, he responded, you can't listen when you're talking. So back to that active listening part, right? So I try very hard to listen to those around me and to elicit ideas from those who often don't speak up. I remember telling another story. I was like, I once worked with the guy that was basically the SDA expert back then. We didn't call it then. We call it space situational awareness. But he was basically the guy um, that was the expert in, in Air Force Space Command. He was a GS-15. He was very, very uh, humble person. And I would take, go to a meeting with him, and I would sit. I was a lieutenant colonel at the time, and I would make sure that he sat at the table. I wouldn't let him sit in the back row make him sit at the table, and I would sit behind him to try to message to the rest of the team, you guys need to listen to this guy. He knows what he's talking about because um, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't often stack up. But I try to make sure that those who have the information and have the expertise get listened to because a lot of times, as you know, they're in the back, they're, especially those cyber operators, they're really shy. <laughs> Thank you. And we can Ms. Reed. Yeah. So for me, I observe and I make myself available. By that, what I mean is AFLUX gets the opportunity to attend a lot of events uh, in different forums, lots of different airmen and guardians. And so what I do is I watch the panels and I look at the panels and who's on them. And I ask myself, is the audience represented by this panel? And when they're not, which many times there, there aren't, I will seek out individuals that do not meet the diversity and inclusion aspects of it, whether it be ethnicity or maybe it's skill set, um, just different perspectives that we have with experiences in life. And I start to have a conversation with them about, so what did you think about this event? And what are you going to take back to your unit? What are some of the things you've learned? How do we get better? How do we improve who's on the panel? So I've kind of made it a passion of mine to make sure that I'm connecting with airmen and guardians that maybe don't feel that connection to bring them into the fight because we're going to do this together and not alone. And so I try to find out what makes them connect. On an average, I will mentor anywhere between five and seven women at any given time across the globe, given the reach that AFWorks has. And I'm constantly trying to figure out how to get them platforms by which to tell their story. Because each of us has a unique story, and that story so defines who we are and how we've gotten where we are at. And anybody has the opportunity to be in any seat at any given time. And I think we sometimes lose sight of that because we think our story doesn't matter. And it does. So I think that's the thing that's, that's key to me is making sure that we're empowering others to be able to tell that story. So my first answer was active listening, which I think you covered well, um, trying to make sure that you are seeking out alternate perspectives and being aware of who else isn't being heard, and I think you covered that well. Um, so the third facet that I'd, I'd offer is education, and, and you guys are doing that beautifully right now. But seeking out ways to improve your toolbox, seeking out ways that you could be a better listener, a better leader, a better mentor, and just aware of what others are going through. So I think between those three, I think that's a really great start for increasing the diversity and inclusion that we have within our service. Absolutely. I have another story. So this is really going to tell how old I am. All right. How many people who are actually know what SAC is? Like Strategic Air Command? Was it even a thing when you started? No, it wasn't. It was when I was. Okay. So I'm a young lieutenant stationed at Vandenberg Air Force Base, right, with the uh, shuttle test group, which you've probably never heard of either. But anyway, um, I'm talking to a, a missile air who's working in the, in the the, the missile training facility there, and he's trying to figure out how to get out of SAC. And I said to him, I don't have to worry about that. There's no jobs for me in SAC. And he comes back and says, oh, yes, we have women in SAC. I said, yeah, but you don't have engineers. <laughs> well, well, thank you. And that actually ties in a bit to the next question, which is 
What do you all envision as opportunities for young women interested in joining cyber or STEM careers in the future? So we can begin with uh, Colonel Dexter. Are you? <laughs> so I think women make up about 50% of this population and currently only about 20% of the service. So I, I'd love to see better representation. Um, and then that number shrinks as we go up in rank. So there are absolutely still barriers to service. And we need to figure out what those are and continue getting after addressing them. I think uh, the WIT has done a fantastic job with this. When I had my first child, uh, he's 14, turning 15 now, uh, there was only six weeks of maternity leave, which is brutal, absolutely brutal. So I'm greatly appreciative for those of, who have fought um, for parental leave as well. I, I think my husband got five, maybe 10 days, and that started the day I checked into the hospital. Um, I didn't need him then, right? Like I had lots of nurses and doctors taking care of me. I needed him afterwards when you are trying to figure out how to put a child that doesn't want to sleep through the night unless you're holding him on a regular sleep cycle. Um, so I would love to see more representation. Um, I think it's about sixth grade uh, where girls start um, diverting from STEM career, careers. So I think about sixth grade is when they start to think I'm not as good in math. Um, so that's about the age group that I'd like to target and make sure that we're getting after that. Um, I grew up 80s, 90s, um, so I was around during the math is hard Barbie. Uh, don't know if you remember all of that, but it's how we're messaging uh, to young children and young girls. So representation matters, uh, seeing us out and about, talking about how um, th those careers are possible and they're not close to women. I think we only have about 30% of women in STEM degrees currently, so I'd love to see those representation, that representation grow. I think uh, that's not just important for gender equality, but also making sure that we're bringing the best ideas forward. So in order to have those best ideas and you know that person that's going to cure cancer, um, that might be a sixth grade girl right now who's thinking maybe I don't belong here. So those are the areas that I'd like to see change and increase over the next decade. Absolutely, thank you. And Dr. Goudreau? I only had two weeks with my first kid. I was in the middle of my PhD program, <laughs> so, so I, I took two weeks off from classes and then I was back. And then again, our, our daughter was the same way. It had to, she would only sleep if you were holding her, so my husband and I slept in shifts. And he had to take leave to be at our daughter's birth, so that was interesting back then too. Um, yeah, so yeah, lots of, lots of stuff. And I just forgot another story I was going to tell, but I'll probably think of it later. But, <laughs> but one of the one of the questions here that you had said um, was was what was something you wish you had known when you first started? And I had put down here. I wrote down, "Don't worry about dating and getting married. Just being with your friends. Just enjoy being with your friends." It wasn't until I stopped thinking, "Oh, I got to get married," that I actually met my husband. Um, and we started out as friends, and so that's we we were going on what 35 years this year. Um, and I related to what the Honorable Jones said earlier. Uh, my husband basically gave up his career. He was a stay-at-home dad for uh, pretty much ever since our daughter, our third daughter was born, so close to 20 years. So I really appreciate what he's done for me. Oh, and I did remember the story that was interesting. So I've had a kind of an interesting thing. So, so when, I, a couple of years ago, uh, or a few years ago now probably, I was, I was invited to speak as an alumni of the Air Force Institute of Technology 100-year celebration. Right, so they actually, they're older than the Air Force, right? Um, and so I was the lead speaker. I thought, well, this is really cool. And then I realized, oh yeah, I'm the oldest, aged before beauty. Okay, got it. Um, so, but, but I've had interesting things is like, when I, when I put together that presentation, I realized that I was like 20% all the way. Like in my calculus class of five people, I was the only woman, right? I went to a college that was 20% women. Right, I was in an ROTC, ROTC detachment, and I had a picture of us, and there were two women and eight guys in the picture. So I was like, "Wow, this is pretty weird." It's twenty percent along, but I also had the the really cool opportunity. I was I was selected as the first chief scientist of the Asian Office of Aerospace Research and Development in Tokyo, Japan, and I got there. And about two weeks after I got there, our admin officer decided to take a job overseas, and so I had to get a replacement. And then, um, and so I'm trying to do his job and my job, and oh, by the way, our director's retiring too. So our director was replaced by a female GS-15, and I ended up hiring, it was an amazing woman, 
I say, like, when I got her resume, I was like, oh, yeah, this one's going to work out. She's got 40 years of service in the government. So I was told by two people, right, don't hire anybody old and don't hire anybody overeducated. She had a Ph.D. in business, right, and 40 years of experience working in the government. I mean, she was so far and above all the other applicants. We had to hire her, and she was amazing. She's just, we still keep in touch. Um, but what was interesting, though, is that office was totally run in Japan, right? At the time, there were like, I, I, and I met like one woman professor the entire time I was there, right? And so, but our office was there. We were, we were completely run by women. And then we were all replaced by men, right? I mean, it just, just sort of happens sometimes. And right now, I have an amazing opportunity. My deputy is, I have a deputy that's um, detailed to me from AFRL. She's female. We hired, uh, my military deputy is also female. And it's, yeah, she's getting replaced by a male, but oh well, darn. <laughs> no, I shouldn't say that. He's going to be great. I'm sure he's going to be great. But but it, it's just kind of cool that I've had that opportunity to be in situations where the entire leadership was, was female. So it's kind of cool. Ms. Reed? So that's a great question for me because, uh, again, given where I, I got started. So my story starts in 1985. I'm a 23-year-old engineer, and I go to my first conference in Las Vegas. It's an auditorium filled with 300 people. I look around and I see one other female, probably in her 50s. I'm the only female giving a technical presentation and I'm surrounded by an audience of men that probably have forgotten more than I've learned at this point in my life. Yet I'm gonna get up and give a technical presentation to them. It was very, very scary. Um, and I remember thinking at that point, I wonder if I'll see this dynamic change in my lifetime or if at best I can hope to change this for my granddaughter. But as I've watched the years go by in the engineering field, I've been very encouraged and inspired by how it is growing. I look now at conferences where there is more attendance with, with women engineers. I look at the fact that school started when my sons were going through, I have three sons by the way, and they were getting their graduation and I would hear scholarships for women going into engineering. And you go to the colleges and you'd see them recognizing that and just how it's really gotten to the point that we're even recruiting to some degree in our middle schools now because that's the age, as you mentioned, that it really starts to, to inspire them. So as I've done all this and watched it grow, I've been thinking about just two weeks ago how I really have been able to see a lot in my lifetime. At South by Southwest, there was a, a panel, all women, senior leaders, and they were from AFWorks and the Defense Innovation Unit and the National Security Innovation Network and the Army Applications Lab. And I thought to myself, wow, I got to see it in my lifetime. What I would say is I would love to see more women in leadership. I'd like to see those numbers go up, and I think we will. And that, if you look at the audience we have here today, you're our future leaders. We want to inspire you. We want you to get to those, to those levels. And I would say this, the thing that, that I wish um, for you and I wish that I had been told very early on was be bold. Do not let fear mute your voice or your actions. Go for it. Thank you all. In the final question before we open it up to the group, what is something you wish you had known when you first started your careers? And what strategies have you found effective in navigating career transitions and adapting to new roles within the ever-changing fields of cyberspace and our STEM careers? I'll go first because I think the other two have already answered it. Um, <laughs> I think what I wish I would have known or realized earlier on is just because there's nobody like you at the table, it doesn't mean you don't belong. It means you have a responsibility to make sure that the way is easier for those who follow you, to your point, um, to figure out what those barriers are, to figure out their, why there aren't others around the table like you, and to seek out younger generations to mentor, um, to help make them the next generation uh, and help you guys get to the table a little bit easier. So I think that's what I wish I would have known. Thank you. And Dr. Goudreau, Ms. Reed, anything you'd like to add? Well, I just think I remember back when I was a young lieutenant and the women that were in leaders at the time, they were scary. Because, no, it was like, man, I do not want to be like that woman. Because 
There was a word they used that starts with a B usually to explain. Um, but did but, they call the males that? That's no, what bothers me. But they. But the problem was, was no, these these women were mean because they, they were because they had no, to be. They, they had to prove that they, they belonged. They thought they had to be. Okay. Fair. They had. I'll let yeah, you finish. Right. <laughs> no, no, she's right. I mean, because they, they felt like they had to prove something, so they were always on the offensive, and and so that was a little bit scary. But then, you know, as I've developed through my career and I met women who weren't like that, and and hopefully I haven't been like that, um, it's it's gotten better. I think. I think I had that reputation when I was younger oh. as a CGO. Because I needed to prove that I belonged. I needed to prove that I was just as smart as the male sitting next to me. And so you have a little bit of a reputation of, I know more than you, and I'm going to prove that I belong here. So it's a little bit of a chip on your shoulder. It's a little bit of a defense mechanism. So I would say, don't let that scare you um, from mentoring those who perhaps have that attitude. Uh, and when they had that attitude, I just said, I graduated from MIT. So. <laughs> I think another way to combat that, one of the ways I used was let your story be, be your voice, right? Let your data and your work ethic speak for itself. I, I, I felt I had to prove myself in the early years, but after a while I figured out data did a lot better job of that than I ever could. So I just became prepared to every meeting that I went to, made sure I had the data. I could answer the 20 different questions we would go down. Um, as an AFWorks representative, I get a ton of exposure to emerging technology. The number of technologies that are out there right now coming at us is kind of overwhelming at times. It can, can make you sit back and go, wow, what do I pick? How do I choose? But what I'm really encouraged by is looking at breakthrough technologies. Like, what's the thing we haven't invented yet that's going to come out in three years, and you're going to sit back to this day and think, wow, we talked about breakthrough technology. I didn't think this was possible. Visit DC and look at all the inventions that happened. And people think, oh, we already have everything we need. We just need to repurpose it. And I, I disagree with that mindset to some, to some extent. I do believe there's still more to be invented. And it's right here in this room, locked up in your minds. Think about it. Think about the impossible. Things you don't think. I used to, when I first started innovation, I wasn't having a good day unless I had at least one person completely laugh out loud at my idea. Because that meant I was truly testing the envelope and, and trying to go forward. And I would say that I challenge each of you as airmen and guardians. Uh, what I would tell you I wished I had known in addition to the thing I said earlier was put disruptive thinking into your day-to-day -day activities. Everything you do, disruptive. What can it be done different? How do we get that next new thing that nobody knows about? What's going to help us deter is the fact that we don't know yet what that obstacle is because it's still locked up, but we're going to find out in the next year as we go after combat innovation, as we go after the great power competition, and we challenge and empower each of you to do that. I'm just so excited about the opportunities we have going forward with the individuals that are serving today and the ones that are yet to come. Thank you all. And with that, I'd actually like to open it up to the live audience here uh, for any questions. This is working. Hi, I'm Carla Pompey. I'm with the Air Force Global Strike Command Public Affairs at Barksdale. And um, my, my comment first is, that, you know, in the 25, 30 years I've been serving active duty and civilian, we've seen a ton of strides made in diversity and inclusion across the DOD. But how would you, how do you ladies see us moving forward when it's discouraging to see some states passing anti-DEI acts and, and kind of a backlash about DEI, how can we message it in a positive way so that we're not seeing the pushback that we've seen over the last probably year or two? For me, I think it's more the why behind it. Uh, we are trying to bring forth good solutions. We are trying to make sure that every good idea comes forward and isn't stifled because of someone's background, whatever that may be. Um, so instead of focusing on the diversity and inclusion, I think I would focus on the why we are focused on diversity and inclusion. So that would be my recommendation. I like that because I think a lot of times what we see with the, um, the different ad campaigns that are going against some of the, the things that we're trying to do in that area is it's fear, fear of the unknown, not truly understanding. So, you know, a lot of times we need to challenge each other to understand that why. I think that's the, the key point. 
but then again, listen to what they're telling us so that we can again solve that wicked problem, right? Because that's one of our wicked problems right now. So how do we make sure we're constantly getting better at this? Thank you. And next question. Uh, Cadet Mars, uh, Afrotsi Detachment 867, Norwich University. So I am 31 days away from commissioning as a cyber officer. So <laughs> thank you. Um, so I just wanted to ask kind of, I guess, advice for either junior officers, people about to commission, and women who are going into these STEM fields. Like what advice would you have for those, those of us who are just about to start our journeys? Congratulations, what an exciting time. Um, oh gosh, so many thoughts running through my head. Um, what do I recommend to the next generation? Um, be curious, um, challenge the status quo. I think as a junior officer, I was trying so hard to learn how to Air Force uh, that I didn't think to challenge any of the current ideas or regulations um, and understand why those were existing. Um, so learn everything that you can about your job, um, but remain curious too and, and challenge uh, some of the limitations that are put out there. And I would add to that, surround yourself by people smarter than you. That's always a good plan. <laughs> yeah, and kind of related to that in a sense, I'd say that every encounter that you have, I read this in a Reader's Digest magazine back when I was like in high school, and it's always stuck with me, that every encounter you have with someone has either a positive or a negative effect, right? So if you want to try to make sure that the positives outweigh the negatives, because some negatives will happen. But, but you know, just really be a, and the other one, my mom used to tell me, mom's advice is always great, right? Be nice to those on your way up, because you'll see them again on your way down. <laughs> Thank you. Tech Sergeant Matty Golnick, my eighth second, Medical Squadron, Grand Christian NATO Air Base, Germany. Um, my question is for you all, there seems to be a resounding um, effect that your partner had to give something up for you to succeed. So is AFWORKS looking at our dependent spouses in a way for them um, to support them to not have to give up their career as well? I know that there's certain programs out there um, to aid our spouses, um, but this is something that definitely affects GSUs and other units that don't have as much support. Is there anything AFWORKS or other units are using to implement innovation? So I apologize, some of what you said cut out, so I might have missed the demographic of what you were talking about, but I think the question had to do with what kind of programs do we have to help spouses with respect to serving? Yes, ma'am. Um, essentially, one thing that's continually heard by women in leadership roles is that their spouse has to give something up, their career or their goals for us to succeed, and that's really unfortunate. Um, I feel that we should all be able to succeed, and I was curious if AFWORKS has anything um, coming down the pipe as innovation for spouses. So we get a lot of uh, ideas in quality of life, and I will tell you, if you have not or you do not know about Project Rosie, I would recommend you go out on LinkedIn and take a look that program was started about a year ago, and it's focused specifically on how do we bring the spouses of our military stationed at bases into different career fields, one of them being innovation. Like, how do we get them into the innovation space, helping us go after these ideas and solve them? So, yes, we have several programs like that that we're starting. So definitely follow that one, and you'll be very intrigued by what they're doing. I would also like to add, though, I don't think my spouse has given up much. He is retiring this summer as a lieutenant colonel in the Space Force as well, so we have been able to balance that dual mill career. Uh, it's been hard, um, but it's absolutely doable, so don't let anyone tell you you can't do something. Um, but I do think some of the women's initiative projects, uh, like I mentioned, the parental leave, have gone a long way in recognizing some of those barriers to service and some of the challenges. I will tell you, when we first got married, I had um, more than one mentor tell me and I don't think he was ever told the same, um, but I had more than one mentor tell me we wouldn't be able to do it. Uh, one of us was going to have to get out. Wink, nudge, uh, guess who that one of us probably was. Um, it was well-intended, but it was ill-informed, and uh, I'm hard-headed for the price of one move. They got two of us, uh, so we've been able to make it work. Haven't always been the most scenic assignments, haven't always been, you know, my dream locations, but the Air Force and now the Space Force has done a fantastic job keeping our family together, so don't let anyone tell you it's not doable. 
Yeah, I've definitely seen cases where it has worked. Um, but I do remember when I was going to uh, squadron officer school, my daughter was eight months old. And I did not want to leave. So I tried to get out of it. I'm like, hey, I've done it by correspondence. Why do I need to go by in, in residence? And they were adamant that I had to go in residence. And when I talked to one of the people, the males, well, when I went, I just took my family. Well, yeah, my husband's active duty Air Force. He can't take off. And back then it was seven weeks. Right? He can't take off seven weeks to, to follow me with a kid to, to SOS. So that was one of the hardest things I had to do was lay my daughter down for a nap, get in the car, and drive 10 hours to SOS. That, that was one of the hardest things I had to do. Um, but, but I did it. And, uh, and my husband and I could depend on my husband to take good care of my daughter, uh, which was good. I do think there are a lot of good programs ongoing in terms of um, recognizing licensing from state to state um, and other barriers that keep spouses from being able to serve. So if there are others out there that you're aware of, um, bring these problems forward. You're probably not the only one going through it. Um, and like I said, you can help make it easier for the next generation after you. So whatever you're experiencing, um, assume that it's common and assume that it doesn't need to be that way. So how do we make that better? Thank you all. And Michelle Leonard, um, Eastern Air Defense Sector. I'm right down the hill from AFRL. Um, my question is about uh, securing our infrastructure. Uh, we use third parties for internet and connection, cloud-based. We're moving right towards a digital system. I'm worried that when we lose the network, we're losing the wars, right? Uh, C2 Imera, Ad Hoc, um, and then obviously Teams, uh, Microsoft uh, products. They're all cloud-based systems, and it reminds me of when I was deployed in 2008 and um, the internet line was cut in the ocean, right, which depleted our ability um, a little bit with our war efforts overseas. How, how, are we, how are we working towards securing a network that we don't own anymore? I can go one bigger and say my power is provided by Aurora Power, my water is provided by Aurora Water. So in a contested environment, will I have access to all of that and how do I fight through? Um, so I think there are a lot of good efforts ongoing, not just on the military network side, uh, but for the larger power infrastructure resiliency piece. Um, we are partnering with AFNORTH. Uh, we are partnering with local communities. Uh, we are involved with CISA, uh, trying to make sure that everybody understands the threat that's out there and that we are all working with a whole of government and industry partner approach uh, to get after securing these networks, because you're absolutely right. Uh, we, we, lose, we lose that access. I don't want to say we lose the war, but we definitely make things more challenging for us. I actually just had a conversation yesterday with AFIMSC, the Installation Mission Support Center, uh, specifically on this topic, uh, and it had to do with expedient basing. So they're putting a lot of hedging of their bets right now into that category because we have to be able to go set up a base fully sustainable in all aspects from communication to the other infrastructure that we need, and I think that is a very high priority right now with leadership given the message from AFA that we're out of time. So there's a, there are a lot of very good programs ongoing, a lot of innovations in work, and there's a lot of things that are at higher levels of classification that we don't know about that are potential solutions to these types of things. That's been one of my primary focuses uh, lately is trying to make sure we have the, the infrastructure needed to operate our systems and, and that we can, it's an infrastructure that we can rely on and count on. Uh, so yeah, definitely, definitely an area that we're working on. Thank you. And next question. Lieutenant Colonel Hillary Kalorn, Montana Joint Force Headquarters. I uh, was the ops officer at the 219th Red Horse Engineer, right? Professional mechanical engineer, number one in my major at the Air Force Academy, private pilot. Not, not trying to brag, but I'm, I'm just setting the stage here. I do a pretty good job, right? But I'm not qualified to be a wing commander because I don't fly an Air Force frame. That's a barrier for all of our non-rated career fields. And we talk about diversity of thought and appreciating diversity of thought and what we can bring to the table and encouraging uh, our members to pursue these STEM careers, yet we have that looming in front of us. And how do we start tackling that barrier?
So that one's a hard one because I will tell you I've had lots of conversations along these lines. Not only the example you gave, but we've had a lot of really, really smart enlisted individuals come to us and say, you know, I will never get the opportunity to lead a command, yet they know a lot and they're very experienced. I have that one right now, to be honest, in my column of wicked problems. So I have about four, four wicked problems that I would love to go after and challenge status quo. I think for the first time, you look at the radical changes being made right now in the structure, and I would say that it's ripe to have those conversations. So I encourage you to bring those up, take them up to the higher level, and let's ask those questions again as our senior leaders are looking at what is the force we need for the future to ensure our win. And I think that's definitely an option for that, that win strategy. Thank you. Yeah, that's kind of in line with what I was going to say. Um, given some of the briefings that we heard at uh, AFA not too long ago, I think the time is right to challenge some of that status quo in the traditional force structure that we've had. Uh, we're, we're looking at changing things up. Um, so ask those questions. Bring forward those um, you know, lost opportunities and, you know, potentially not bringing forward the best within our service simply because of whatever AFSC you might have and then certain opportunities are closed to you. So challenge it. Yeah, that's been one of my issues is trying to hire in a new, uh, new deputy. I was limited to one AFSC. I was like, I do science and technology. Come on. I, you know, there's several AFSCs that ought to qualify, but no, it was tagged to this particular AFSC and I could only look at people with that AFSC. So, yeah, let's, let's relook at that. <laughs> Thank you. And to end our panel on a bit of a more positive note here, we're uh, just going to do a bit of a rapid fire round. We have a few minutes left. So I'd like to ask each of you, can you just share any memorable experience or project where you feel that your diverse perspective has positively, positively influenced the outcome or positively influenced your organization? So, feel-good story. <laughs> so I think for me, it's probably what I did to get the job I have now with AppWorks, which I started last June. So prior to that, for seven years, I was the chief innovation officer at the 96 test wing, which does test and evaluation and installation um, uh, task as well. So what we did is when I first went in, there was a culture that did not exist for innovation. And over the years, what we were able to do, I was able to cultivate that culture. And I did it by, in essence, taking away any barriers of thought that I had. I had no barrier of I don't have enough resources. I had no barrier of I don't have enough money. It was what do we need to do to get after things. And we watched each group commander turn their group into an innovation spirited team. We watched them go after things they didn't think they could change to the point that they adopted the, the mantra of we're not going to change our unit. We're going to change the Air Force. They started looking at how do I put something in place at Eglin and know the next base I go to will have the same thing. And they became very passionate about that. And it was cool to go around and see the warrior ethos that came out as a result of that, just the competition between the groups and the squadrons. And, oh, no, we're going to innovate better than you do. And we had a million-dollar day event where a lot of times you hear AppWorks talk about, you know, their events and they're giving money to contractors. But we wanted to give the money to our airmen. So we had airmen bring in ideas. We had 40-something submitted. 22 made it to the finalist. And we, we funded 14 in one day, gave away $1 million to our airmen to go, go change the Air Force. So that was really exciting. Thank you. I was going to say, when, when I um, came back from Japan, I was sent to the Systems of School and Logistics at Air Force Institute of Technology, not the engineering department, which the engineering school, which they were kind of upset about. But there I was. And I go in there, and one of the first things they said to me was, you're not qualified for the job that we hired you for, so go find something else to do. <laughs> I was like, oh, yay. <laughs> you know? So I thought about going over to the engineering school, but then I thought, well, let's see. What, what's our issue? Now, this is back in 2000, okay? And we were having it. We weren't letting enough people get into AFIT. I mean, we couldn't, we couldn't bring them out of the operational units, right? And I was like, they couldn't get to fill the classes. And I was like, well, if the students can't come to us, we got to figure out how to go to the students. That was one of the things that came across for me. And um, I happened to find out about the Air Force Advanced Distributed Learning Conference that was going on. And so I'm like, well, AFIT needs to go to this. So I go to the uh, lieutenant colonel who's in charge of the distance learning branch and say, hey, you need to go to this. I don't go to any conference I'm not invited to. 
like, this is your job. So I thought, okay, well, I'll go over to the engineering school and see if they're interested in going. So I go over and I run into, you know, I knew the dean from when I had taught at the academy, or the assistant dean. And I go in and I tell him, hey, you know, I think you guys should go to this. And he goes, well, you know, we're, we're not exactly uh, leading edge technology here. And I'm like, ooh, that's bad from our graduate school. Anyway, so I ended up going. And to make a longer story short, because I think we got it. <laughs> um, um, uh, I ended up standing up the, helping to stand up the systems acquisition branch, which was doing distance learning for uh, acquisitions um, back, you know, way that, like 20 years ago. So I think hopefully I helped bring distance learning to the, to the Air Force uh, Institute of Technology. And my daughter was actually one of the first cohorts to do uh, distance learning systems engineering without having to actually pay tuition. They were charging tuition to active duty pilots to go to school on their own time. I thought this was crazy. So finally we did get that changed, so that's good. Yeah, and Colonel Dexter, final I feel thought? like this is one of those moments where someone asks you what your favorite song is and you forget every song that was ever written. <laughs> um, so it, it's hard for me because I don't know if there was any decision that was strictly because of my gender or anything specific to me. Um, I think they were just decisions that I've made that have had a good impact. So a lighthearted story. Um, we had a trunk or treat uh, for Halloween last year and there was a little girl who was just fascinated with the fact that I was the Space Base Delta Commander. And she would come up to me co constantly, hi, Commander, hi, Commander. Um, and it was absolutely adorable. But I talked about wanting to hit that sixth grade level. She was right at that level. So for her, we have totally normalized that there is a Space Base Delta Commander. That happens to be a woman. And uh, she was, you know, just really delighted by that fact. And so that is one that just, you know, um, has a positive impact for me. Thank you all for sharing these insights with us all. We will be speaking with most of you later today in our afternoon breakout sessions for continued discussion on women in STEM and cyberspace. So please join me in thanking our panelists today. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please take a 10 minute break while we prepare our stage for the next session, Security Advisorship, Evolving Roles of the WPS Gender Advisor. Good morning to all our WASPs, distinguished guests and attendees in person and virtually. I am Ms. Nanette Howard, the Department of the Air Force Women, Peace and Security Program Manager. It will be my honor to serve as the moderator for this panel entitled The Evolving Role of the DAF Gender Advisor. Before we get started, we would like to share the DAF WPS introduction video. Around the world, conflict and disasters disproportionately affect women and children. Yet women remain underrepresented in efforts to secure against and resolve conflict. Research shows that when women participate in security and peace negotiations, agreement is 64% less likely to fail and 35% more likely to last at least 15 years. A wide range of barriers still prevent women's meaningful participation, including biases and perceptions of gender norms of men and women, legal and policy barriers, and a lack of gender-informed perspectives throughout planning and operations. Women, Peace, and Security is an internationally recognized framework utilized within the U.S. and among our allies and partners to address these challenges. The United States introduced the Women, Peace, and Security Act in October 2017 to ensure meaningful participation of women in preventing, mitigating, and resolving conflict. This law tasked the Department of Defense, Department of State, and Department of Homeland Security and United States Agency for International Development to implement WPS initiatives. In 2020, the Department of Defense released its WPS Strategic Framework and Implementation Plan. The DOD framework outlines three primary objectives.
As an extension of the DOD framework, the Department of the Air Force established women, peace, and security objectives for the Air and Space Force, Air Force Reserve, and Air National Guard, which include applying the WPS framework to core functions, such as training and doctrine, exercises, operations, and security cooperations to promote WPS principles and gender perspectives. The Department of the Air Force is committed to implementing WPS across all Air and Space Force functions to ensure readiness by training our gender advisory workforce, ensuring WPS principles in all training curriculum, and conducting gender analysis to reduce barriers and improve gender equity. The Women, Peace, and Security Initiative asks us to examine our processes and organizations differently. To face the complex security challenges of today and in the future, we must grow our understanding of how gender relates to the outcomes within the security sector. We hope we hope you enjoyed the presentation of the DAP WPS video, and feel free to use, the, to use it to spread the word on the important WPS efforts across the DAP and the world. It's our hope after today's panel, you will join our team in executing a gender analysis during one of the three breakout sessions. This will be a hands-on exercise in applying key WPS concepts in operational and everyday planning. Now, today we have three knowledgeable, boots on the ground, individuals who have served in different capacities concerning the DAF WPS program. I would like to introduce Colonel Michaela Brancata, National Guard Gender Advisor, Lieutenant Colonel Aaron Salinas, Space Force Gen Ed, and Lieutenant Colonel Natalie Winkles, MAGCOM Gen Ed, as our panelists for today's topic entitled, Women, Peace and Security, the Evolving Role of the DAF Gender Advisor. As the DAF is moving forward to re-optimizing for great power competition, we are featuring WPS gender advisors and practitioners from across the field. These experts offer a wide range of perspectives. We will discuss what role the gender advisor plays in today's case of change and why they must evolve in today's contested environment. I encourage everyone to check out their bios, which can be found on the virtual program. So, before we start this journey, I would appreciate it if each, of, each one of you can introduce yourself and provide a short synopsis of your role in the DAF WPS program as a gender advisor and practitioner. We will start with Colonel Brancata. Thanks, Ms. Nanette. Awesome. I'm so fired up to be here again with all of you. So you get me twice. Uh, actually, three times if I'll see you in the breakout. So. Um, as I mentioned before, um, I was introduced to Women, Peace, and Security in my in-residence professional military education. It was offered as a writing award and as a elective uh, class. And um, I had an honor to be able to study with several of our State Department colleagues who actually started this even earlier than the Department of Defense, so learned some great insights from them as well. But fast forward a couple years after that, I had the honor of working as the Guard Advisor to the Secretary of the Air Force for Manpower and Reserve Affairs, SAFMR, in the Pentagon, where the program had just moved from International Affairs, as I mentioned, over to MR so that it could be cross-function across all of the Air and Space Force. And at that time, um, we were still trying to learn what does this look like for our services. Um, the OSD and Joint Staff had started, um, they had received congressional funding, and they were starting to stand up a program. And what that led in the Department of the Air Force was we stood up an executive steering group, which originally started with three co-chairs, so senior leaders of general officers or SCS equivalents, and then it was supposed to be cross-functional, which it very quickly became pretty much every function on the staff. Um, so all the uh, uh, air and space side of the house had representation. 
Uh, we also stood up three working groups. So the first one being very focused on our internal look at our training, our recruiting, what's in our curriculum, how we force develop um, and implement this across those functions. Our second working group was for operations, exercise, and uh, our strategy. So a very A3, A5 um, centric and same on the, the Space Force side of the house. And then our third working group being that security cooperation, international affairs uh, for our Guard and Reserve, our state partnership program, and um, our engagements with our partners. Um, but really at that time, we had very few trained gender advisors or gender focal points. So that was our starting point was, and I'm proud to say we now have over 400 trained that are out across our forces, um, being able to advise specifically and do gender analysis. Uh, but we still have a long ways that we need to go. Um, we were also the first service to start the, or have a published Women, Peace, and Security Action Plan. So that was published in April 23, out there for you guys to Google and uh, be able to read. Uh, and now we're working on field implementation guides so that we can get this at all units and functions. Um, and then also, we have a congressional mandated report every year to track our metrics to see how we're making progress in this program. Um, so again, a shout out to all of our male allies. I wanna thank you for learning more. Um, when you look at an underrepresented population, no matter what that is, you have to have the majority that continues to advocate alongside of the underrepresented population. And I truly believe that when you look at one underrepresented population, in this case, women or gender, um, then you will see in all different underrepresented populations across our force, which will make us more lethal, more ready, and to be able to fight not only today, but the next conflict. Thank you. Lieutenant Colonel Salinas. Hi, everyone. I'm so honored to be here today. I especially want to say thank you to everyone who's attending virtually. If you're on Ops 4 watching, thank you so much for your service to our nation. And for those of you who are watching or recording later, later so that you can be both a great operator and attend WISP, thank you so much for what you do every day. I'm new to Women, Peace, and Security. I started um, my first uh, uh, foray into it in March 2023, so I'm the newest person on the panel. I'm very excited to be here, though. Um, my background is space operations. I'm a career space operator. I started my career in missiles, and I also have experience in electronic warfare, um, command and control, and uh, space domain awareness. Currently, I work at Headquarters Space Force, and I am uh, part of the staff who works on global force management um, at the Pentagon today. Thanks so much. Thank you, ma'am. Lieutenant Colonel Winkles. All right, how is this? How is this? Am I closer? Is this better? Closer. Closer? Hello. <laughs> okay. This is harder than it looks. Bear with me. Okay. <clears throat> yes. Hi. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Natalie Winkles. I am, just like everyone else has said, I am thrilled to be here. I've been looking forward to this for weeks. I, I did not sleep well, and I'm over-caffeinated. <laughs> so, um, I am here with part of the staff and our team. Uh, I am a reservist. Where are my total four service members? Yay! Yes. Um, and I will be starting orders with them full time to be able to do this work um, that, and carry forward the last year and a half that I've been a part of this team um, as a gender focal point and a gender advisor. Uh, some, of, some of that work, as has kind of already been alluded to, relates to our training and education of our gender network. So last summer I was out at Air University and DAF put on our first Ops 100 course with about 60 students. Are any of you here? Oh man, that would've been cool. All right. Uh, from there, I went out to the Pentagon and did the joint-led course. Hey. Uh, so, uh, are, are any of you here from that course? Just you and me, Aaron. All right. Uh, awesome, awesome course. But, but the best course in my entire professional development career, hands down. Um, 
uh, from there, so I'm also on uh, working group one, which as was it, yeah, Colonel Brancato stated that it gets after LOE one, so that uh, education and training piece, and as a re related to that, I'm on the joint PME working group for women, peace, and security. Again, looking at best practices, lessons learned, how we can how we can move forward in a thoughtful way as a joint service, because we don't want to be doing this in, in just, you know, different models and it's all disjointed. We really want to look at this intentionally. So that's really an important part of how we get this off the ground successfully. And I, let's see, so shifting gears a little bit, my background uh, as an airman, I've got almost 18 years of active duty service. I am a reservist, but I have worked Title 10 orders almost continuously since I uh, joined the reserves. So I started off as a, in aviation as a, as a pilot in the KC-135, and um, I've, I've flown five aircraft throughout my career. So that is my, my tactical background. Um, but I've also worked as a sexual assault prevention response victim advocate since 2011. And when I'm not on orders and um, just a civilian, I'm also a childbirth educator, a birth doula, and a lactation coach. So I'm, I'm highly committed to... <laughs> Thank you. The, well, the well-being of our service members with respect to their maternal and reproductive rights. These are readiness issues. These are important to our total force and how we show up. Um, so a lot more working groups related to that, but I'll, I'll wrap it up. So thank you. Wow. Thanks. To all our notable panelists, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today. We're looking forward to learning from your unique perspectives and expertise in WPS. My first question will go to Colonel Brancata. You have been deeply involved in the DAF WPS program as the first DAF program manager for the past three years. How would you describe the role of the agenda advisor in comparison to Operation Allies Welcome 2021 to the role of the agenda advisor concerning the DAF Great Power Competition era? Yeah, thanks for that question. So I want to take you guys back three years ago. Um, this was very new for everyone, including myself. Even though I'd been introduced to it, I, I had no idea what to expect when the baton got handed to me to help the Air Force and Space Force stand this up. Um, but it was at the time where Operations Allies Welcome was kicking off and NORTHCOM had officially tasked the services to supply eight gender advisors out to our different locations to help the Afghan refugees uh, transition. And literally all of us said, what's a gender advisor? Where do we find them? And how do we get them to these locations? So that's, again, where we started. And this is a very young and new program. So excited to ask all of your help, because now you're all uh, that much smarter to know about what WPS is. Um, so I'm really proud of our working group one, because one of the things they did was get special experienced identifiers for our graduates that attend the Operations 100 and 200 courses. And they were able to then, we have that tracked in your military records for our military members. For our civilians, you can update that in your MyBiz, and we have a little checklist of how you do that if you've gone to one of those courses. Um, and so, again, that was our first way to start fixing that problem of how do we find those that have this experience. Um, and again, we'll continue to get more courses for those that want to attend. Um, at the beginning, OSC Joint Staff was the only one that offered the course, and we got two, and we fought for four um, slots in the class. So I'm really excited to see that we now offer um, uh, mobile training courses, online courses, and um, several of our total force partners are putting on courses uh, as well throughout the year. So although the Operations Allies Welcome was an unprecedented event, uh, there were so many lessons learned from that that we saw that we could have fixed in our planning process. Things like where you put your bathrooms and how you light them and the security of transiting from the different camps to get to those to prevent any violent, gender-based violence. Um, or the example I love to give when senior leaders ask me to explain this, which is the difference between equity and equality. So equal was we gave every Afghan refugee 20 minutes to look through the winter donation, the closed for winter donations. 
But that was not equitable when it looked at the male who needed the 20 minutes to find clothes for himself, but for the female who was looking for clothes for her and her five children, um, that was not, 20 minutes did not suffice. So again, some of these types of principles in WPS that were learned from that operation that now going forward to our other operations and uh, specifically our great power competition. So as we mentioned in the earlier panel with um, uh, Major Bruschke, is that the, our adversaries are not looking at like this. In fact, they're actually going backwards in some regards to a more traditional model for their members. And really, when you look at that, when we look at our recruiting and our retention numbers, uh, to be able to access all talent, no matter where they came from, their backgrounds, and what they're looking of interest to go into, we open it up to our entire population, we're gonna be stronger for it. Um, I would also say that um, intentionally when we look at the underrepresented population, I gave you all this example earlier, um, single dads, or I have, I have some part-time guardsmen that are uh, stay-at-home dads um, and doing their military career in a part-time status to support whether it's a dual mill situation or a dual professional. Um, um, and up in Michigan, we have some of the female spouses that are um, in the automotive industry and a couple of my guardsmen are stay-at-home dads and I, I find it an amazing balance and a perspective that they bring to our team that I really couldn't do without. Um, so what are we doing at the DAF level? Um, we are doing gender analysis. We've started to look at numbers in our recruiting, our retention, across the board in our leadership. You know, does 20% of bringing in the door, um, that probably equates to why we're at about 6% of the E8 and above and 06 and above, that change in uh, percentage, and what are the trends that are affecting that, and do we need to make some changes there? Uh, and making rec recommendations to our senior leaders. But we're not just stopping there, we're also looking at equipment, facilities, um, exercise and deployment team makeup. I have to give a shout out to our international partners in the room or online. Um, Australia, we were in an Indopaycom exercise. Our entire leadership team from the US were all of male gender and our Aussies brought to our attention, where are the women? Um, so again, if we're looking to model and employ this, um, something just to take into consideration. And again, it doesn't mean that we swing the pendulum completely the other direction. We need to have balance and we need to have a good representation, uh, whether that's enlisted officer, civilian, whether that's you know different functions, um, not just gender. But again, when you look at gender, you'll start to see you know, all other underrepresented populations. So what can we do? First step, learn what WPS is about. Second step, how does it apply to your own function or organizations? And the third step is not just holding that information, but to actually make recommendations and put it into action. So we have come a long way in the last few years, but there is a need to take it to the next level, and I'm asking all of your help to do that. Colonel Brancata, thank you so much for the insightful perspective in providing a possible roadmap for the evolution of the JAF Gender Advisor. Next, we will turn to Lieutenant Colonel Salinas for our next question. Lieutenant Colonel Salinas, I've read the Space Force lines of effort, which enable the service to provide the forces, personnel, and partnerships required to preserve, to preserve U.S. space superiority. Which of these three or all, can you align the role of gender advisors in what has been referred to as the new frontier? Line of effort one, field combat, field, com field combat ready force. Line of effort two, amplify the guardian spirit. And line of effort three, partner to win. Over to you, ma'am. So if I can, I wanna talk about all three. Um, the CSO note on fielding combat ready forces is really inspiring to me when it talks about the fully boarded crew force requirements, the C2 requirements, the intel requirements, the networks, the cyber defense, the sustainability, and the facilities, and all of those requirements and needing them to have fully burdened systems. I believe that gender is part of all of those requirements because we need gender as a part of everything. Um, I want to talk a little bit uh, about a story that inspires me from Invisible Women. 
It's a, a book on um, data. And the story is about Starbucks. And at Starbucks, they used AI to uh, create a scheduling software. The AI is mostly working off of um, sales data. So there's no human factors um, in, the, in, the, in the software. But Starbucks used it to determine when to have more people on shift and when to have less people. The company says that workers get about one week notice for their schedule with the software. But according to the researchers that did the research um, in the book, only about two of the 17 outlets, uh, workers at those places actually reported that they got a full week. Some workers actually reported that they only got one week, uh, or excuse me, one day's worth of notice for scheduling. And that piece of AI, while it may have helped them, it also really hurt them because the people that had to be involved in uh, actually working at Starbucks didn't have any of the, the factors, uh, their human factors taken into consideration, any of the things that really mattered to them. And for Space Force, I think that's so significant because we can't afford to create barriers and stresses um, for, our, for our workers. We don't have the luxury of a revolving door workforce. We're relying on our experience and we're interested in growing our experience through that advanced training that we already heard about it a little bit today. Our missions can't pay the opportunity cost of innovation that comes from high turnover rates. And we have a real chance here in space as we stand up the service, as we stand up some of these processes, especially when Lieutenant General Miller mentioned earlier today, our new force generation process out there that we're working on standing up. We have a real chance to set it up um, so that gender is included and it opens that door for everyone. Our destiny is shared but our using a gender lens doesn't just enable equality, it also is gonna enable the deterring of our adversaries and the defense of our nation. So moving into amplifying the guardian spirit, we've gotta unleash our creativity, our innovation and determination, and bold collaborative problem solvers, they need every tool that they can get. And this is a tool that we can use. Colonel Agarwal, the Delta II commander in his change of command speech said that a guardian is someone who takes an understanding and turns it into an opportunity. But if you don't have a full understanding, how can you take advantage of that full opportunity? Gender is a huge part of socialization and it's a large part of a lot of our identities. It's really important that we have a complete understanding of the operational environment and we use every tool out there to get it. When we're partnering to win with our, our fellow nations for WPS and for space, it's so important to us to have those collaborative partnerships. Um, I wanna say thank you to all the Canadian service members who are out there um, working in missile warning sites today. Thank you so much. They work right alongside all of our uh, American guardians and it's such an important part of who the Space Force is to continue to work with our international partners and to let both of our nations achieve our goals, international security objectives, to work together both in space operations and to further that cooperation, but also furthering our values um, by implementing WPS. Thank you so much for the question. Lieutenant Colonel Salinas, thank you for aligning not only the Space Force LOEs, but comparing them to the DAF Great Power Competition lines of effort. Education is the imperative to providing guardians who are prepared to lead in an unconventional space. Now, Lieutenant Colonel Winkles, the DAF WPS Strategic Action Plan states, the gender network exists at all levels and through multiple organizations to enable comprehensive WPS implementation. As we discuss the role of gender advisors embedded in these networks, where do you believe or how can men support the DAF Women, Peace and Security Program? Okay, so the good news here is there is no gender prerequisite for Women, Peace and Security. It is available to anyone 
And I think it's also important to note that being a woman doesn't make you just innately better at being a gender focal point or gender advisor uh, as, as any, any different than it would make a man better or worse. Women, peace, and security isn't about a who, it's a how, it's an approach, and we really need to set aside those just false assumptions right off the bat. Um, there is a lot of strategy and doctrine and policy and LOEs and, and objectives that we're trying to get everybody on the same page and we're rolling out all these guidances kind of just as we go through each um, you know, leadership change and as we make more progress. But that is confusing at times to, to consider, well, what does that look like on a day-to-day -day basis in your unit, whether you're just a an NCO or a first line supervisor, how, how does WPS, how do you, how do you, where do you start? And we owe that as gender advisors and gender focal points uh, to assist with figuring out just real examples of this. And it's, it's going to be different because WPS is not meant to be an additive thing. It is, it is alive and amongst you as we speak. It's just a matter of how you look at it. Uh, so I have a little story and, um, for me, it is, it is important to share some smaller, more relatable stories like this so that we can kind of begin to digest WPS. And as Colonel Brancato said, it, it, it is an international and a foreign policy, very much so, but it's also something that we need to execute within our own service. We need to model this. This is something that gives us a, a competitive advantage. And so well, how are we gonna do that if we, if we have some, some issues within our own service that, that kind of make that contradictory to our allies and our partners. So the story that I have uh, refers to, I, I mentioned I was a victim advocate uh, in the previous uh, question. Um, is anybody here from SEER, Survival, Evasion, Resistance, and Escape? I'm striking out so bad today, okay. <laughs> uh, but you've heard of it, right? Up at Spokane, uh, Washington, Fairchild. You guys have heard of it? Okay, yeah. So uh, I went there in 2008 after I graduated pilot training. It's about a month-long course. It's a little bit of a Hunger Games. And part of that is about 48 to 72 hours in a mock prison. And it's, um, it's unpleasant. Uh, you are deprived of food, sleep. You're completely disorientated. You're referred to by a number. Um, and you are subjected to physical beatings. It's what they call it. Um, as well as interrogations. And then you're instructed on how to conduct yourself in a captive environment and evaluated on it. So you have to, you know, you have to perform to an extent on, on what you're being taught. So I graduated the course thinking, I'm never going to use this. Um, but I was wrong because in 2011, I was working my first case. And I was sitting next to a very young airman who had fought for her life and for hours, uh, we were in a room with a defense attorney whose job it was to discredit her, degrade her, harass her, threaten her, and uh, what I witnessed was very re-traumatizing, not only for her, but absolutely for me. However, I had SEER training, so we used that uh, it was just a habit pattern that kicked in. It wasn't like I mission planned and was like, I'm gonna use it. It, it, it just happened. Um, I found myself just kind of going into some of the roles that I had, had learned to just to survive that experience. But she didn't have that training. And so as, as we moved forward in the case, I thought, how are we gonna get her to take the stand by herself in a scary courtroom with her perpetrator staring her down? Um, that was a huge ask of her. And if she didn't, then the case basically lost its key witness and most likely this would just stop right there in the, in the legal proceedings. So it was really important. Um, it was also important to her, but I think she was struggling with how, how we're gonna do this. And that's when it occurred to me I needed to get her uh, with the superintendent of the SEER squadron at the installation. Uh, he had done some of our recurrency training throughout my time uh, that I was stationed there. So I knew him, I knew he was a prior law enforcement officer and I knew, I knew that he was the exact right person to work with her. He had seen cases like this. Um, his quiet confidence, his demeanor, his trauma informed approach, just the trust that I had in him 
no one else came to mind. And, and so he agreed when he heard the case details without hesitation to work with her. And this wasn't part of his PD or his duty description or anything. This was just him taking this opportunity to, in my opinion, do the right thing and help her. And we were successful. She was able to participate in the justice process. And, and this perpetrator was, uh, he was discharged from service. I, I think that's a successful example of how we worked together to give her the support and ask her what she needed. Like, she's the one who's going through this. What did she need? And involved her in that process and amplified her voice, but then also gave her the solidarity to be able to do that larger work of not only fighting for her life, but that should have been where her fight, her fight stopped. She still had to fight through the cultural barriers. So again, that's, that was a data point for us within, within the WPS model of, okay, we need this data. We need this data to demonstrate why this huge problem of sexual assault is is undermining our, our readiness and our effectiveness as a source. And, and I don't want to reduce her experience to a data point, but, but in my opinion, just with respect to how we view sexual assault, that is where we're getting some success at eradicating it and, and saying, no, this is, this is preventable and it has to stop. It has to stop. So, um, I'll wrap it up by saying WPS is not a nice to have. It is a data driven, intentional and strategic look at global stability by, by looking at those very critical failures in the human security aspect. Um, and so how can men help with the original question, right? Is, you know, take a page out of that superintendent's playbook. Look for that fired up NCO who will not shut up about WPS. Look for that young captain running circles around herself trying to do good. Bring them in under your wing. Guide them. Listen to them. Look for those opportunities. We've been saying opportunity all morning, and you just might find one. Thank you. Awesome. Lieutenant Colonel Winkles, thank you for not only expressing the role of men in the WPS program, but also providing examples reference the need to perform a gender analysis when developing unit and or operational plans. Friendly reminder to our virtual audience members to start typing your question into the chat if you haven't already. And please include your name, rank, organization, and to which panelists you'd like to direct your question. Before we turn it over to the audience for questions, I have one final question for our panelists. Final question for each of you, in keeping with the Women, Air, and Space Symposium theme, Simon Fortier, Stronger Together or Stronger at the Same Time, please align this Latin saying with women, peace, and security. Colonel Brancata. Yes, so I'm going to hurry us up so that we can get to your questions, but um, we have come a long way. How many of you thought WPS meant weapons squadron or weapons school? I heard that from a lot of leaders in the Pentagon, uh, but it can have multiple meanings depending on what context you're in. And it is a congressionally mandated program that I'm just proud that the Air and Space Force have uh, continued to lead the way and will bring um, our um, combatant commands, our academia, and our joint services all together. I really feel this is the entry into being truly joint that we've talked about in our NDSs for years. Um, it's a very low cost of investment um, because, again, it's just it's a framework of, of way of doing analysis, of doing planning. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to see where we can go as we are in a stage in our services of being open-minded to change. And I really do think, too, that um, this cannot be an add-on program. We can't think of it as an additional duty or something else that we need to make time for. It's got to be integrated into what we're already doing, executing our missions, developing our airmen in our planning. It'll save time. It'll save money. And we all know that we don't have all of that to go around. Uh, so um, we cannot afford to exclude any of our talent. We have to be innovative. And so, therefore, finding ways to use this analysis to, you know, take it to the next level will become stronger together as a force. Awesome. Thank you, Lieutenant Colonel. Thank you, Colonel Brancato. 
Lieutenant Colonel Salinas, over to you. Same question, ma'am. To me, stronger together for the Space Force means we create that switchback up a mountain that's repeatable. While it's still tough to get up that trail, you can still do it based on your determination and your skills. You don't need any special uh, equipment, and you didn't have to have the perfect directions in order to get there. Um, for us, as a service, we have such an opportunity to set up our processes and include gender as a part of that so that we can set up our service to be without barriers. Barriers aren't necessary. They're just something that's there to get in everyone's way. I want to make sure that, and I think that being stronger together means that path is open for everyone, not just women or gender non-conforming people, but for men as well. We're stronger when we open that door and we allow more people entrance. The, everything that we do benefits everyone. We're better when our entire team can focus. We're better when the leaders with the best skills get promoted. And we're better when our teams can solve our operations problems with innovation and creativity. So I'm looking forward to continuing to work to be stronger together. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant Colonel Salinas. Lieutenant Colonel Winkles, over to you for your thoughts and then questions from the audience. Okay, so I'm gonna steal this one from my joint PME working group. Um, the, if you go onto YouTube, you can, you can type in there the 2023 Naval War College WPS Symposium, and you should find right away a playlist. And I'm hoping that they put that link in the, in the chat um, so that you can easily access that. If the moderator didn't do that, just email me. I'm on Globo and I'll send it to you. Um, and there is a video within that huge playlist, a massive playlist. So if you scroll down, 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 and you look for critical thinking, and you listen to that, one of the presenters, Mr. Robert Gustenstein, says, we don't need women to win the battle. We need them to win the war and sustain peace. And that includes WPS. Um, he says, if we want to develop the next generation of the fighting force as the critical thinkers that we need, and we've heard that theme again mentioned throughout this morning several times, we have to consider the asynchronous nature of warfare. We know that we know that the number one driver of terrorism is conflict. And we also know that gender norms, relations, and equalities, inequalities directly relate to the potential for the eruption of conflict. And so we're talking about, again, through a gender analysis framework, through that lens, about finding how we can, how we can be more operationally effective and how that falls within our national security strategy and our na national defense strategy. So this is going to take everyone's participation. It's going to take our decision makers, our senior leaders, our commanders, our operators, tacticians, logisticians, analysts, our medical support team. Uh, anyone who I haven't named, it's going to take you as well. And we, we need everyone now. This is, this is a call to action. Thank you. Awesome. Wow, thank you all for your thoughts. There seems to be a definite roadmap being built for the DAF Gender Advisors role, reference a case for change, reoptimizing for great power competition. Now, and I'm super excited. We'll now start the audience and virtual Q&A portion of this session. Hi, yes, good morning. Mm -hmm. I'm First Lieutenant Andrea Pongress. Uh, I'm an air advisor and general focal point with the 818 Mobility Support Advisory Squadron. This message is for anyone on the panel. Uh, thank you all for everything that you do. It's wonderful to be here and hear from you all. My question is, what is our strategy in messaging, or what should it be in messaging the stakeholder value of WPS of our partners in alignment with our own U.S. interests to our own forces? We have our strategic 
frameworks and action plans at the national DOD and now the DAF levels. But what we've seen at the tactical level as air advisors is that U.S. forces and then you see in the joint environment, it gets even more complex, that our teammates just don't feel or see the value or investment like some of our partner nations do in WPS efforts and initiative. For context, uh, a team and I just got back from Kenya um, from just as Exercise Justified Accord, where we had the opportunity to lead a WPS seminar and subsequent CPX. And what we saw was the integration of gender perspectives at such large scale, from the academics uh, course to the mission analysis brief development and into each of the staff functions and respective cells within the CPX. And uh, we did voice interviews with several partners, both men and women. We wanted to capture both perspectives from our partner nation um, teammates. And we saw a trend in what their stakeholder value was in WPS and how exactly they expressed it. And it all centered to what they've witnessed and experienced specifically during peacekeeping operations and missions, what they saw in terms of gender-based violence, SCA, displacement. And these are the faces and voices of champions of WPS within our partner nation um, environment and our teammates. And we honestly, as U.S. forces, are very blessed and very fortunate to be distant from the geopolitical regions and backyards of our partner nations. Uh, and where they're located, who see the impacts of war and conflict on those disproportionately affected populations. Um, and so how do we sync and message that return on investment in WPS in our own forces while considering the ROI and stakeholder value of our partners? And one of the things that stuck out the most to me uh, running that WPS workshop was a male partner in that course said, where are our male instructors for WPS? So that really stuck with me. Thank you. Okay, first I want to say you're, you're going to be a panelist next year, right? Okay, get her name. Over to the panel. Yes, that is fantastic. I appreciate your experience and bringing that back. And so that is how I would first answer that, is we have to share best practices of how we're operationalizing this because we need to be able to give examples. And one thing that I said a lot in Senior Leader 101 briefs is that just like different nations are at different places on the spectrum of understanding and implementing WPS, and you could even shorten that to integrating women in their security sectors or military, and we have to take down some of our own unconscious bias. Like you think maybe some African nations aren't as further along in WPS, that is not the case because they saw this, it actually, the UN Security Council resolution came out of Africa, some of the conflicts and uh, natural disasters that they were experiencing. Um, same with other countries across the world. They see a need and so they are getting after it and well before the United States did. So, and just the same as when we look at our partners, is the same for our own service members. They are at different places on the spectrum of understanding and figuring out how to implement this. And so I always tell, we always have these conversations of you cannot share this with the unwilling. If they are not in a time or place to be able to hear it, there is no need to get defensive or try to cram it down somebody's throat. You have to find ways to either show data, show examples, give some lessons learned of how this is important or why it matters. Um, but I also think too that I need, I mean we need all of us to bring that information together and pass it back up to Ms. Howard and the team in the Pentagon so that not only can they capture this for the congressional report and showing what we're doing with it, but also so that we can learn from each other. This is my intelligence career field of we definitely need to not recreate the information. We need to share it and be able to utilize it to make all of our organizations better. What am I forgetting, team? So ma'am, to, to build on what you already said, um, one thing that I've recently learned about is the solidarity dividend. It's, um, there's a lot of information about it. It has a racial aspect to it, but the book is called The Sum of Us. And it's one of those things where it's a very eye-opening book for me personally, but I think that some of these types of um, divisive language about zero-sum game and um, people not getting anything out of it because it doesn't seem to directly impact them. Um, one of the ways that I think that you can deal with um, those discussions is to have them. 
Um, and to be honest about why zero sum is a myth and that when we all work together and more people have access to create the pie, then there's more pie. And giving examples specifically about how this does impact that person, I think that those are, are ways to address it in a more positive and, and honest light because that, that perception is out there and I, I see it and, you know, we can, we can all hear in our workplaces sometimes um, a lack of empathy, but that is just because someone has a lack of empathy on a topic, it's not a permanent uh, disease. You can, you can cure it sometimes by helping people understand how that lack of empathy or how that specific incidence does impact them and how together we can move forward and make things better uh, in, in, together. Thank you so much. We'll take the next question, please. Hello, my name is Whitney Stone from the 30th Engineering Squadron. Uh, my question is for Colonel Broncado. I recently learned through PME about the National Guard's State Partnership Program, which I was unfamiliar with previously and quite amazed by. And so I'm curious how the ANG is utilizing that program to promote and advance WPS. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, yes, the State Partnership Program, I believe we just celebrated our 30th anniversary. Um, over 100 partners, um, every guard unit um, has a, or guard state, every state has partners. Um, and it can be everything on the Army side of the house from setting up, you know, security, um, logistics, um, on the air side of the house, you know, doing planning, helping them integrate their weapon systems. Um, so it's a, it's a fantastic program. One of our three priorities is a, air na or a guard, National Guard, um, along with our federal mission to support and augment and then our state missions of helping our communities. Uh, but I think it has a very natural WPS uh, place because again many of our international partners are asking for this they're asking for training they're asking for networking opportunities um, I had a very interesting uh, experience my husband being also in the guard uh, had gone on one of our state partnership trips um, to the country of Bulgaria it's Tennessee's uh, state partner and um, that particular trip uh, unfortunately it was a missed opportunity because we took all men on that uh, trip from our leadership. We have women in leadership in the state of Tennessee. It's just on that particular trip we had not planned for that. And it was the Bulgarian who the Bulgarians had invested in sending their one slot to the Air Force Academy, uh, I think probably every decade maybe, um, uh, 2008 graduate um, from the Air Force Academy, and she was the one that asked us, where are your women? So again, I think we start to see our partners ask for this, um, for us to be modeling, employing, and helping them. And so again, we need to get more familiar ourselves. Uh, but that is one way, one reason why you'll see the total force very much alongside of our active duty counterparts in this, because our mission sets have some natural integration in this space. So would love to talk more of it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. And now our, our next three. Hi, good morning. Master Sergeant Sarah Borges. I'm the first sergeant for the 5th Security Forces out at Minot. Um, so as a first sergeant, unfortunately, I'm too familiar with the sexual assault. Oh, sorry, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. uh, as a first sergeant, I'm uh, all too familiar with sexual assault cases um, and how that process uh, lays out as uh, the legal happens. So Colonel Winkle, you mentioned your example, um, and that made me think of the Office of Special Trial Counsel that just stood up, who's taking a large part in looking at those cases. So I'm curious, what is uh, WPS looking at? How are they gathering those data points? And are you working with the OSTC as they're gathering that information as they move forward? So I personally am not. I am working with LOE One Working Group One on the education and training piece. And uh, the special trial council that you mentioned, that just stood up uh, very late at the end of last year. So we don't really have a full response or plan with how we're going to track that, the efficacy of that, but I'm going to pivot really quickly and say that it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to get some sex disaggregated data to give us a way to intentionally inform how we move forward with this. And the specific question was how we're working with, with, with that equity. Was that what you were asking? Really just how are you gathering your data? 
or the, the team as a whole, not you can, can I interject? Please, yeah. I, I'm not part of the panel. I'm sorry. <laughs> so like Colonel Winkle said, there's opportunities. And so when you become a focal point or you sit in on one of our interest meetings, it's as simple as that. Bring those questions to us. But also when you do that, we appreciate a way forward and how or why you think that is a data point for our program. Again, this is all about data, vignettes. How do we get our leadership, our individual side by side to see how WPS is in action and what it can do? So I really appreciate that. Get our information and let us remember, hopefully one of our team members is, is writing it down. <laughs> Probably not, but that means write it down. Um, Ma'am, were you going to mention the DOD IRC? Yes, okay. I, w I was going to mention too that yeah. um, some wonderful gender advisors were successful at getting the independent review commission that came out that looked at a lot of the uh, sexual assaults and prevention across the Air and Space Force. Um, we have five WPS specific IRC recommendations and that was part of the drive of standing up this program at large and so training up a gender network being able to implement this into our training and education our operations and exercises so you know prevention gender-based violence looking at that is a huge piece of WPS and so you know we're, we're still trying to get our arms around how do we have the data and the metrics and what are we showing as our qualitative and quantitative to that, but it is very much a piece of this. So, but again, more opportunity to grow there. And thank you for your work as first sergeant. Yeah, and that IRC, it had over 80, recommend, around 80 recommendations for the service component. So it's it's massive and we're still trying to get after that, like, like, like they've all said, but um, if you want to read it, it is several hundred pages, so. Looking forward to it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, so much. Next. Hi, Major Aaron Leon, Space Forces, Space Public Affairs. My question is for Lieutenant Colonel Salinas. I was wondering, it can be very difficult when you're only working with systems or satellites to convey why it's important to incorporate the human aspect and how to actually do that. So do you have any examples of how gender analysis has made the Space Force better? Um, sure. I can give, <clears throat> I can give an analysis about, um, yeah, so um, one, one thing that you can do is to look at uh, what the effect is on the effect you're having. So I want to answer your question with two different examples. Um, of the, one of the previous gender advisors for the Space Force was from GPS mission area, and she actually wrote a, a very informative paper um, about how you can um, utilize GPS and the things that GPS does. But it's not necessarily about um, the operations of GPS per se, it's about the impact of GPS. There's lots of different space missions where the impact is, is, is an easier entry point and it's a little bit easier to see how, how that technology is used differently. Um, so that's one example. Um, another example is what I've been working on um, with the service in terms of policy. So my job is global force management and one of the things that I work on is uh, SPA for Gen policy. So when I looked at the SPA for Gen policy, I wanted to understand how um, this policy would impact men, women, boys and girls, um, and gender non-conforming people, and if it would hit them differently. So I went and I, I did uh, an analysis of that, and I found some things that I felt were concerning. Um, so I've tried to take that analysis and work with other people, um, just people that are other AOs on the staff to try to help um, ensure that the policy fully covers uh, everyone and that we have everything available support-wise for people that they need. Um, so those are just two of the ways. I would say that the one of the key things to remember with all technology is somebody created that technology. If the technology wasn't created for you, or with you in mind, that really matters on how you use that technology. 
And just because technology was created a certain way doesn't always mean that it's being used that way. Um, so those are, those are my, I guess, uh, ideas on that. Does anyone else have one? I'll just add a quick tactical example. So again, uh, we got asked by one of our international partners about um, imagery and um, not only the technology side, but also our analyst side of do we take gender into consideration? So that was a question that went back to our executive steering group, uh, the A26 representative, of how are we training our imagery analysts? You know, are we looking for like a female gate in a burqa versus a male gate? Are we looking at, um, you know, just the effects on a population or a community or whatnot when we're using some of those types of um, equipment? And so again, not only from the, the weapon system or the actual technology, but also for how our humans interact with that. And I think it's really important as we go forward with all of our future technologies. Um, you know, there's some definite stats in this book, The Invisible Women, that talk about, you know, some of our safety, um, all of the tests that the automotive industry was working on safety equipment was very much on a male structure. And so now we're starting to integrate more different body types and um, male and female when it comes to some of these testing and whatnot. And AI being, you know, if you have majority of men programmers, you know, can Siri hear my voice as well as they, they can my spouse. And so just some of those types of things that we really need to consider as we're looking at gender. Thank you, ladies. Awesome. Thank you, ma'am. And I think our last question, bring it home. <laughs> that is very loaded, ma'am. Hi, Sergeant Kabiko to file over the 10th medical group at USAFA. Um, I have a question for Lieutenant Colonel Winkles. Um, so you brought up your situation of how you're a victim advocate and you, you utilize your SEERS training and you're able to help your victim to kind of hone it in and kind of stand trial in front of her perpetrator. Um, my question is, is SEER training, that trauma training, is that being incorporated for victims advocate? Um, I just feel like that would be a really important asset, especially we're trying to encourage and uplift our victims to kind of stand trial and then put the bad people away? So that, that experience, that story was back in 2011. It was before I was involved with, with the formality of WPS as it is today. So, um, and I've moved out of that role. Um, and that's not to say that that couldn't happen, but I think it's just a way to demonstrate sort of the organic capability of WPS. We're, I think it's been already said, we don't have to wait for it to be perfect. We don't have to wait for permission. We don't have to wait for these things to be in place for, for us to get the results that we need. Part of that is just leadership. I think that's my response there, yeah. <laughs> but thank you for giving us something to think about. But go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Now we've come to an end of our session, and we are pretty much on time, okay? So hey, before we close out this session, I want to announce and hope that you have signed up for one of our three breakout sessions, the development of a gender analysis. This demonstration will provide you a hands-on opportunity to see WPS in action. Hope to see you there. All right, friends, that concludes our panel discussion. Thank you to our distinguished panelists for answering our questions and leading us in such an important discussion. To the audience, I hope, over the past hour, your knowledge of WPS and the role of the gender advisor has expanded your desire to get connected. I'm excited to see your involvement and implementation of WPS in the near future. Thank you all. Ladies and gentlemen, before you step away, sorry. Thank you, Ms. Howard, for sharing this important topic with us. Thank you for joining us. This includes the virtual broadcast for today's program. We will convene again tomorrow at 0800 for day two of our broadcast. For our in-person audience, please stand by.